So good morning, good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to see you guys. Um, and I'm really pleased that you could all make it today. Um, apologies for the glitches with the, the time zone changes and everything. Um, I just presumed that everybody's time zone changed at the end of the month, like the UK's does. Um, so here we are. We're finally here. Um, happy birthday, Farhan. Sorry. It thank, was you, thank, you. Cha -cha. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cha cha cha. Thank you. Thank you. Cha cha cha. So, yeah, welcome for our first sickle cell trait re education. I've called it re education session because I believe that's what it is. I believe that's what needs to happen um, because of the narrative that's out there. Um, welcome to everyone who's watching us live on Facebook or um, within Zoom as well. And welcome to all my amazing panelists. Um, Dr. Austin, it's been a long awaited, um, a long awaited time that I've, I've been hoping to, to meet with you. So I'm really excited to have you with us. Um, and Jackie, Sean, Agnes, Faustina, Farhan, Samantha, welcome. Um, this is our you know, global voices united um, in this in this cause to, to spread awareness about sickle cell trait. Um, so I'm gonna go straight into why the support group was formed. Um, as I think the majority of you guys know that last year I had the worst sickle cell crisis of my life um, as, a, as a sickle cell trait um, individual. And I've always known that I had the trait um, since age five, I've always suffered um, with crises, but my mom was always given the, the, the usual, it's growing pains. Um, and when I got to about 10 years old, I started talking to neighbors who were adults and they had children of their own. Um, they had sickle cell anemia. And when I, when I started talking to them and telling them about my experiences and the way I was I, I literally was bed bound. Um, my, the fevers would come on. Um, I'd have stabbing pains and swell, swelling on my arms and my legs. Um, I'd have stabbing pains in my joints, um, but also the long bones in my arms, my legs. Um, and I just remember these images of, while I've been growing up, the images in my head were just of being bed bound as a child and just screaming. That's all I, I can recall, just remembering myself, just screaming. And that stayed with me growing up because it continued into my teenage years. Um, I had such severe anemia as well. And um, when I reached puberty and I started my menstrual cycles, I, I was really, really bad. Um, and the pains, I was, my attendance in school was extremely poor. Um, I missed school every month. And it just seemed to get worse. When I started my working life, I was often sick, always getting frequent infections as well. Um, and the crises continued. Um, but because I just continued getting told um, or continued being told that um, it's impossible, you know, a lot of doctors that I spoke to were just always the same where they just say oh it's impossible and I just wrote it out at home and that's all I knew to do um it was I felt very very isolated and very alone growing up because I felt like I had no one to talk to and a lot of times if I had any events or anything that I needed to be part of or was invited say like if friends invited me anywhere um I always just um just to cancel last minute or just be exhausted and I got tired of having to explain myself constantly to people as to why I always had to cancel or you know why I was like this and I, I noticed growing up it's it's been a lonely journey because a lot of people have just kind of just kind of let me know that actually um actually you know they, they've kind of just dropped off my friends list and not really told me why and I, I know why um, it's always just been because of how my how my body was and and because I was cancelling things all the time. Um, so it's it's been a very emotionally lonely journey, um, very a very traumatic one. And then the past year was the worst crisis of my life. And and I've often had like um, breathlessness when I'm exercising. 
Um, but I never really knew what that was down to. I never really put it down to the trait because I, I went to uni, my lecturer, I spoke to her and I said, can someone with the trait suffer? I said, because I do. And she said, yeah, because obviously if there's any abnormality in your blood um, and she was a she was a nurse um, before she became a lecturer and um, she'd retired and she's she just said to me in, in as simple terms as possible she said well if there's any abnormality in your hemoglobin um, the ability for the body to carry oxygen to every every part of your body is you know limited um, and in some conditions you can experience the same symptoms as those of sickle cell anemia so because she told me that I felt assured and I just knew that I knew that I knew what I what I'd experienced all the time growing up um, in my tw in my 20s and um, since hitting my 30s and now I'm 36 years old I'm still suffering and it seems to be getting worse um, symptoms that I didn't even know could happen happened last year um and symptoms that i um symptoms that i wasn't aware of new symptoms that i'd never experienced until i started researching um i i'd never experienced them before and i i realized that this was all in relation to my crises um and things that i'd experienced on their own as standalone type symptoms um such as stiff neck um i didn't know that that was in relation to sickle cell um trait as well and when i started researching i found out that the past couple of years my neck had been really stiff and then my back had gone um in 2017 and i couldn't walk i i have a crutch in my office because i borrowed it from my brother i literally was bed bound for a month where i couldn't get out of bed without my mom who's extremely small she's very petite very tiny and i tower over her she had to lift me up because from my shoulders down i felt like i was paralyzed i couldn't move my legs um my back was just really bad it was it was just my back and i didn't realize um when i'd gone to have physio they actually told me um that it wasn't it wasn't um my any any of my spine um they said it was musculoskeletal mus i can't say the word musculoskeletal um and they said it was probably just my muscles and no, no one could really help me and I realize now it's it's in relation to my status with the trait because of symptoms that I experienced at the same that came on at the same time when I had the crises and have continued since um, last year. So on the fifteenth of June last year, um, I I was quite fatigued and because of COVID, my mom's been quite sick and I'd been looking after her, um, and I I just ended up exercising because that was always my go-to thing. And I felt like I couldn't breathe. It was quite a warm day and I exercised inside the living room. And um, I just felt like I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was gasping for air. And I stopped doing what I was doing and I thought, okay, 10 minutes is better than none. And I stopped. And um, later that night after I'd had a bath, I was going to bed. It was about 9 p.m. And I noticed that my arm, my right arm was swollen. My hand had swollen and the pain that had started. And, and then I remembered this was always what used to happen as a child. And I thought, uh oh, and I had a bad feeling as well. I just felt like something bad was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and by 2 a.m. in the morning, it just got really, really, really bad. Um, where my whole arm had swollen and it was it was agony and then my ribs by the morning my ribs had swollen my stomach had swollen um, my legs the pain in my legs and my arms was really bad um, and throughout the whole of June July um, August I was just I, I couldn't use my hands I couldn't feed myself I couldn't bathe myself um, I was physically disabled um, and just exhausted, continually exhausted. Um, and then it affected my cycle as well to the point where my cycle stopped. Um, in, and, and I believe it's down to my hemoglobin levels being so low, but because I phoned the doctor and the doctor didn't give me an answer, um, they didn't tell me anything. Um, I didn't have any help 
I just felt really ignored. Um, and then I think at the, at the onset of, of the crisis, I decided, well, let me, let me try and start something. Let me just ask if anybody else um, that I know has sickle cell trait and if they're symptomatic. And so I did. And that basically was how this group, um, the sickle cell trait support and information group was born. Um, the more I kept, it, it kind of happened where people that I knew, friends and family, um, decided to get in touch with me. And um, they told me that they had, they had the trait and they were symptomatic. Um, so literally, it was, that was how it was born. And, and I decided that, you know, we need to start spreading awareness. If I'm going through this, my mind wasn't right at the time. I felt like at times I wanted to die. Um, and I, I said to my mom, I just wish I was dead. Um, and it's, it's been a journey. And then I ended up with the final straw was having a stroke um, at the end of the, at the end of the year, I ended the year with a mini stroke. Um, and I've still got complications to today. And now my passion is spreading awareness about sickle cell trait, um, connecting with people who have the trait, hearing their stories and, you know, presenting this and, and trying to change things medically as well, because I think medics a lot of the time don't really know um, the risks. They're not really educated or even really spend much time in med school learning about it, according to um, my cousin, who's a, a med, med student. Um, and he said they just do five minutes and that's, that's where you guys all come in and how today came about. Um, so that's my story in as brief as possible. Um, and I would like to, oh, I'll tell, I'll type in the um, comments, my email address, and I'd like to hand over to Dr. Tomia Austin. Um, she is Doctor of Public Health. Um, correct me if I get this wrong, please. Um, a sickle cell trait educator and researcher and the executive director of As One Foundation in, is it Texas? Houston, Texas, yes. Perfect, thank you. I, may I share my screen? Um, I believe so. I'll just, I'll mute myself and then I'll, I'll give you the go ahead. Oh, I didn't want to start on that slide. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much. Uh, this is a privilege uh, because sickle cell, why is my, why is that happening? Sickle cell trait literacy uh, has been my passion now uh, for more than 11 years uh, working with the Aswan Foundation, but it, it is now, and, and my dear um, brother in this field here in the United States, Ferran Dozier can speak to our living in the trenches when it comes to sickle cell trait. But, um, you know, COVID-19 has happened and our, our reach has expanded. Uh, so here we are, sickle cell trait re-education. I love that uh, title, by the way. Uh, at the As One Foundation, um, our mission is to empower families globally. And with an audience in the UK and Lagos and Saudi Arabia and Australia, I, I do believe we are working within our mission. Uh, empowering families globally, delivering life-saving sickle cell education. This organization was founded by DeVar Darling. At the time, he was a, 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 a current NFL player, but his story begins bo being born in Nassau, Bahamas, uh, as an identical twin. <clears throat> they uh, were surprised to their parents, to the doctors when they were born, uh, as throughout the pregnancy, they had continue to hear two hearts beating as one. And that is where the name of this organization uh, comes from. Devard and Devon, uh, along with their siblings and mother, after their parent, parents divorced, moved to Houston area. 
uh, when the, the twins were very young, they went to Houston, uh, Fort Bend Independent School District uh, Middle High School and were recruited nationally to play football at Florida State University where they did play as true freshmen. And then uh, at the end of their freshman year during off season workouts that those extended conditioning workouts, which we'll talk about um, later in my presentation, Devon actually, uh, after a number of collapses, after passing out, being carried through the drills by his teammates, being deprived of hydration, uh, being de deprived of recovery, he died on February 26, 2001. So we have just passed the 20 year mark of Devon's passing. But once Devard, after a number of ups and downs and downs and downs, he did end up at another school clear across the state at Washington State University, where he played for two years in memory of his brother, inspired by their shared dreams. And upon being drafted into the National Football League, which was their shared dream, he established the As One Foundation in memory of his brother. And he just did not want his brother's memory to die. He wanted to you know, share the legacy and through the As One Foundation, that is what we do. Um, we, we know a lot about sickle cell uh, on this panel in the United States. It is very common. Uh, so I won't bore you with the, those, um, that set of information, but just, I have to drive the point that this condition, this, this disorder is something that is not just affecting people in the United States as often, oh, it affects African-Americans. Uh, in this global instance, it is not just something that affects people of African descent. This is something that affects people of many uh, uh, ethnicities, including Asian, Indian, Italian, Latin, Greek, Irish, Turkish descent. And that's important. We, we drive that point home by saying that this is a, not a skin color thing, it's a bloodline thing. So everyone is, uh, is due to know what sickle cell is. Uh, this is something that we refer to as universal precautions. Educate everybody because it's likely to, you know, by some distance and a lot closer for others affect uh, someone you know, if not you. But, you know, and this, this comes from certain myths uh, that are shared mainly that sickle cell trait is benign. It only affects African-Americans, there's nothing to worry about. And then the, the myth of stigma is, is, has various um, levels to it because you know, the stigma can be internalized as, oh, I can't, or, I, uh, or there's nothing to worry about, or it can be an inferred uh, stigma by employers oh, well, you can't do this. And we, we have historical context for flight attendants and astronauts and so on. Uh, but uh, we're here to dispel some of the myths today. Uh, the, the benign myth is um, really, really challenged by the fact that as you just heard a firsthand account of a person living with sickle cell trait, or as we call her, a sickle cell trait warrior, has experienced a number of complications. This is not a unique instance. I, I hear it quite a bit. And so some of the things that I have captured in my talks, uh, gleaning from the research, uh, cl chronic fatigue, splenic infarction, uh, invasive pneumococcal disease, uh, venous thromboembolism, retinopathy, kidney, which is a whole, you know, <laughs> area unto itself. Believe it or not, acute chest syndrome. This is in the research. Avascular necrosis, it's in the research. Exer exertional sickling is the area that the Aswan Foundation mainly targets those um, uh, exertional uh, collapse associated with sickle cell trait. Unfortunately, as is uh, was the case with Devon Darling and unfortunately too many others. And as we are in this COVID-19 time, even COVID-19 uh, has an association, uh, an adverse health effect association uh, with sickle cell trait. So I, I have just taken the time to just 
briefly define these issues. Uh, I am not a clinician. I am not a physician. I am a researcher. And as much as possible, I have listed one resource, but there are numerous for each of these. Uh, chronic fatigue, I've, I've heard it expressed to me as, oh, I'm just tired for no reason. I just, I just can't get it together. And sometimes tired for a long time. Uh, and in the case of the exertion that athletes go through or people that you know, exert, whether they're dancers or in the marching band, they, their recovery time is extended. Splenic infarct, that this is also pretty common when we talk about elevation or flying. I've heard a number of people express um, having these issues when flying or mountain climbing or deep sea diving. Um, it can be experienced as chest pain when breathing or even nausea. Um, invasive pneumococcal disease, also known as pneumonia. Uh, this is found in trait and uh, 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 the, the C trait. Uh, that's, that it's common in the C trait. And, and if you're experiencing any of this, continue. If you have the luxury or the privilege to be able to switch clinicians because you're not feeling heard, I absolutely recommend you find another clinician that will go on this journey with you. Because as was spoken before, our uh, providers here in the United States have certainly uh, confirmed that they get five minutes, the, the, the total of five minutes in a typical medical school curriculum. And even sickle cell is covered within a two week genetics lecture. So unless there is interest or specialty, most of the providers are uh, leave medical school unarmed. So the patients themselves are left to educate their own providers. Uh, venous thromboembolism, blood clots. Uh, we, you know, this is typical, uh, but this is this has shown up in sickle cell trait, and we're going to hear more about that from other presenters. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, retinopathy, anywhere you have blood, anywhere you have blood vessels, that you know you can have. Uh, issues. And this is not um, also uncommon with the trait warrior. So annual uh, eye examina uh, examinations are recommended. The kidney connection is vast. Um, the, the, the big one is the rare but fatal, often fatal, renal medullary carcinoma. And there's been some really good uh, recent research that is now connecting or associating exertion with the RMC. Uh, so there's lots out there about it, but from the bedwetting to the blood and the urine, uh, and often when it comes to RMC, if, if the blood and the urine is already there, it's often too late. Um, but, uh, you know, flank pain, it's just, it's just a lot there. So that's why hydration, 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 hydration is so important for all of us, sickle cell, sickle cell trait or not, but especially uh, for sickle cell and sickle cell trait, you cannot, well, let me not say you cannot overhydrate, but it is of just vast importance to hydrate, to keep good blood flow, to keep good flush. Uh, and of course the beauty regimen of good skin and good hair and all of that, but um, this is in, in good, very, very good practice for good kidney health. Acute chest syndrome, again, this is in the research. And uh, you know, our patients are, not, are reporting not being listened to, but uh, the research that, and, and I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit to, um, with, with rela as it relates to the COVID-19, because this association you know, with the respiratory issues that are associated with COVID-19 is why this is important. So again, if you're experiencing chest pain, it, you know, discomfort or respiratory issues, and you're not supported by your clinician, second or third or fourth or fifth or sixth opinion. And yes, sometimes it is taken as many as that many times to find a physician that will be on your side and champion you, but that's exactly what's needed because it's not a lot in the research. And unfortunately, clinicians are trained to 
receive it from the research. And that is, you know, something that the Aswan Foundation is definitely working to mitigate. But in the meantime, we listen to the people and this is what the people have told us. Also, we've heard it already, growing pains. And growing pains is a real thing, but how real is it if you're 40? How real is it if you're in your late 30s? It ain't growing pains no more. So uh, just to speak frank about it, um, exertional sickling, again, this is where the Aswan Foundation uh, spends most of, you know, we, we target the exertional sickling because a lot of this is brought on as we now have seen in the most recent research about um, RMC is there's an association with exertion. So that's where we feel we can make the most difference and not trying to prevent exertion. DeVard played eight years as a National Football League player. And if that's not exerting, I don't know what is, but he knew his body, he hydrated properly, great trainers. It is not a death sentence. It certainly does not have to be a death sentence, but getting to know your body, getting uh, you know, good care, and working in concert with your medical team, and it should be a team. Um, you can, you know, deal with these. You can survive these. And I, I won't go in into much depth there because I know Ferran is going to, you know, drive this point home. Uh, but this is where the universal precautions, uh, where we are, for example, every October, the world turns pink because that is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Everyone is not going to get breast cancer, you know, and even though it is something that can affect males, but um, pink fire trucks, pink footballs, pink cleats, pink, pink gloves, I mean, pink everything. They, you, everyone is, is, is being universally educated about breast cancer so that the, the ones who need it can be caught. And I believe with everything in me that this is the same approach needed for sickle cell sickle cell trade especially. Right now, our surveillance is telling us three to four million in the United States. I believe it's way more than that because we're dealing with older numbers. And if I am quoting good numbers, I believe breast cancer affects about 160,000 people annually and sickle cell trade in the U United States. And sickle cell trade affects about 4 million. Hmm, that's a, you know, universal education. It's a lot of people affected and a lot of people that don't know. So um, if you're a dancer, if you're working out, if you are a football player or a basketball player or decide just to take on your bucket list and run a marathon and you have sickle cell trait or you don't know you have sickle cell trait, this is why this is important. Uh, I just can't state it any clearly. And of course, the uh, potential uh, associations with the adverse health effects associated with COVID-19 is not to be taken lightly for sickle cell trait warriors as well. So as I said, the exertional sickling is where we focus because obviously Devon Darling and a number of athletes, unfortunately before and after him, uh, but there's some things that look like cramps that are not cramps, that, that is a, a trait crisis. Uh, as is described. And the research is also showing us that sickle cell trait is the top non-injury killer of athletes here in the United States. Again, reason to take this very seriously. Uh, usually this is presenting the, these deaths, these collapse are occurring when there is extended conditioning. Me, you know, meaning, you know, not, 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 um, a, a little bit of working and then stop for a break. So if you know the game of American football, we have first down, second down, third down, fourth down. In between those downs, the play stops. And if there's a timeout, you know, the trainer runs on the field and, you know, gives out water. Uh, but in a conditioning workout, which is usually not actually during the season, is you know, before season, it's, it's usually a measurement test to see what type of shape you're in or, a, you know, approving for a, 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 a position or, you know, order to save your position on a team. Those conditioning workouts is, is often the danger zone. It's that perfect storm because either there's been no activity 
And now you got to come in and show who you are, go hard, get through that wall. And there is no gradual increase from rest to intensity. You know, hydration can be a little iffy. And certainly the recovery time is, is not there as much as it should be because you're, you know, you got to go to the next drill. You got to go to the next drill. And these drills are extended like 30, 44, 45 minutes at a time. And, um, and, and what it looks like is the athlete is usually going all the way down. It's usually not taking a knee. They go all the way down. Um, and we have exercises here in the United States that kind of give you a hint. Suicides, that's the name of an exercise. A uh, gasser, where you're so gassed that you're, you're not catching your breath. Those are the names of the exercises. And those are indicators of the danger zone for our trait warriors. Uh, can they be survived? Yes, obviously DeVar did, um, but he lost his brother and too many other young athletes have. So again, these long uh, muscle, long bone pains, um, usually lower back. Again, we're talking about the kidneys there. Um, and unfortunately death has been the result. And it just doesn't have to be, this is preventable. So in response to that, uh, uh, Devar, uh, Devon passed away in 2001. Um, and then um, I believe it's Dale Lloyd, who actually died uh, right here at Rice University in 2006. There were incidences between and unfortunately since, but Dale Lloyd's death actually brought about the NCAA expand, expanding their mandate for all three divisions. It, it initially, it was just the top division one, but uh, Rice was not a, div a division one school. So their, their mandate was not there. And so the, they, the family, of course, sued the school for the negligence and death of their son, but also wanted uh, his death to be meaningful. So they worked with and insisted that the NCAA do something to make sure that this did not continue to happen so that their son's death resulted in the mandate to test athletes at, at all three divisions. And it, it is helping, it is raising awareness, but we are yet not there yet because athletes continue to suffer and die. Uh, but education is the key. And that is you know, a part of the Aswan Foundation goal. And I'm certainly, uh, pleased to present here because this is a part of that. This is a part of that. Um, so the, the research is showing us that there are three risk factor areas. Dehydration, number one. Elevation, that, that's when we you know, start getting into that splenic infarct uh, area. And that elevation, uh, you know, a swift change. So that's high or low, mountain climbing, deep sea diving, Denver, Colorado, anybody heard the Ryan uh, Clark story, the NFL player who ended up losing his spleen and a number of, of other organs after playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers at the Denver Broncos. Uh, thankfully, he lived and continues to talk about his sickle cell trait story as a professional athlete, but that is exactly where that's from, that elevation. And then finally, as I said, the exertion, the rhabdo, which for Ryan will talk about extensively, is the third risk factor that has been identified. Uh, renal medullary carcinoma um, is listed here because it's, it's that attention grabber. Yes, it's a rare cancer that's associated primarily with sickle cell trait warriors. And now we have research that's showing that there's a, a, an association to the exertion uh, in trait warriors to that rhabdo, I mean, I'm sorry, to that RMC. And the, the, the key thing here is this, this RMC is often mostly diagnosed at stage four when there is no time to, not a lot of time left to uh, change things, to reverse it, to, to address it. And I, I would love to see us be able to find a way to diagnose early. And that's certainly a part of our long range plans there. As I said, uh, sickle cell trait matters because this is uh, uh, classified as a top killer of um, collegiate athletes where people of African descent are disproportionately represented. And here's an example, or here are examples. 
uh, to the first on the screen, that is Devon Darling. And Dale Lloyd, of course, is the son that um, his, his death is, you know, led to the expansion of the NCAA mandate for testing for all athletes, division one, two, II, and three. Uh, Eric Planchard, there's an interesting story here. Um, uh, Eric Planchard, the, the, the training, the, what is it? The uh, conditioning trainer, I know I'm not saying it right. Um, actually, that was responsible for overworking the athletes at University of Central Florida in 2008 when Eric Planter passed away. If you skip over, Shanice was also the, uh, the coach, the strength and conditioning coach that was responsible for overworking the athletes in 2015 when Ted Agu died. I just think that that is just pretty amazing that this gentleman even had a job and not only continued to work, but is responsible for the death of another athlete in this same way. What, did he learn anything? So that's just my personal <laughs> soapbox moment there because these are beautiful women and men who were sons, who were loved. Uh, Ted Agu, they called him Med School Ted. He was uh, in the Omega, Omega Psi Phi fraternity, but he loved playing football. He was a leader and he was going to be a doctor. And Ted is not with us any longer. And then let's go back to Shanice Clark, female basketball. So, you know, we can't get pigeonholed into just football and just males. She played basketball. And originally they said that her death was attributed to her ch choking on bubble gum that she had chewed. Mm. I'm giving you all the side eye this morning. <laughs> uh, and it's not a laughing matter, but it's just the extremes that, you know, people will go through to go to, to not be responsible. And the responsible thing, the most responsible thing is to educate, educate yourself, educate your staff, educate the athletes themselves. And I, I have personal firsthand experience with the athletes because that's where I conducted my research. And you talk to those athletes, they surprise you. They did surprise me. They want to know. They want their teammates to know. They don't care about stigma. If you're on that court, then you, you've obviously earned your place on that court. Who's talking to them? I mean, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just end that there. And then Eric Gall is an interesting example. Number one, because he, he started as an athlete at my alma mater at Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, Florida, but he transferred. And on his first day of training, and remember I was talking about when these uh, E-cast events usually happen. It's usually on the first day of conditioning workouts within the first hour. So it is not a workup kind of thing. It's, it's usually happening immediately. On the first day of practice, he collapsed and died. And it gets a little more heart-wrenching because what you're looking at here are middle and high schoolers who have also passed. Their deaths were associated with sickle cell trait. Um, again, another female basketball player, two beautiful young men. And then Carson Cross here on the end, um, Caucasian. And, and his family, both his mother and father knew that he had trait. On the first day of practice, I believe he was 13 years old, he collapsed. Uh, his father is an EMT, but he was not, he did not, he actually died at the hospital. Um, and he was there, his mother and father's only child, and he is loved and, uh, and again, preventable. If, 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 if certain things would be in place, or what, if were, were in place for these death not, deaths not to happen. So what, what is happening? We have our newborn screenings, and I know that this is something that is needed and, you know, internationally, but even here in the United States, we have room for improvement because essentially what's happening is without consistency, meaning that it's done differently state to state, uh, in the event, number one, the search is, is indirectly for sickle cell trait. The search is for, the sc they're screening for sickle cell. So when sickle cell trait is diagnosed, there is a letter that's sent, if a letter is sent, 
Um, and that letter basically is a notification letter with a couple of bullets saying that it's not disease, you'll live, your child will live a normal life. Um, and oh, by the way, don't procreate with another person that has sickle cell trait to avoid that 25% chance of a sickle cell birth. And oh, okay, nothing to worry about. So where does that letter go in the junk drawer in the kitchen? And um, I know we're gonna hear more about this, so I'm not gonna even go too deep here. Um, but we got a lot of room for improvement as it relates to our newborn screening. Um, because if the newborn screenings happen at birth, and there's an only, the only other time that there's a testing mandate is if a child goes to play um, NCAA sports, where is the conversation? What is the discussion? What is the parent's knowledge? What is the child's knowledge? And I'm sure we all agree that sickle cell trait needs to be discussed in, in the household. That I believe it's, it is just as important as the transition education that happens for sickle cell anemia children that have to transition from peds to adult medicine. This is transition education for trait warrior children. Um, especially because we have deaths that are still, still occurring, unexplained pain, unexplained fatigue, and so on. So as I was saying, the, we, I've just identified these as three conversations in a lifetime about sickle cell trait at diagnosis, if they play sports, and unfortunately after it's too late. That's, that's where we have the most time to discuss sickle cell trait. And if your child is not an athlete, but maybe they're a dancer or they go to uh, do a, 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 a sorority or fraternity, maybe it's only discussed twice. And we need, I, you know, we should be discussing sickle cell trait more than three times in a lifetime. Agreed? I agree. agree. So here's my proposal. I'm proposing 10 different times in a lifetime to have conversations about sickle cell trait uh, before birth at family planning. You know, uh, it's, it was, we were discussing uh, testing and uh, genetic counseling and, and things getting better, true. But, you know, here's uh, my proposal at family planning, because if, if nothing else, two parents who have sickle cell trait, who are aware or may not be aware, at least can have informed decision making, you know, to their advantage. I've, I've heard so many parents say to me, I had no idea. And some say, if I had known, I might have made a different decision. And some say, if I had, you know, it wouldn't have mattered. I believe in faith. But at, in any case, it is beneficial for everyone to be informed. So family planning and then genetic counseling, which is still, uh, there's lots of room for improvement there uh, with genetic counseling. Um, at diagnosis, which is the first opportunity for conversation in the previous slide, at diagnosis, uh, this would be the third time. So by the time you get to diagnosis, we've got all these well-informed parents and family members about, because everybody's getting universal uh, education and, 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 you know, everybody knows what's going on. And it's not just that myth or, you know, the street committee knowledge that's being passed around. Sensitive testing. And, you know, I'm, I'm so excited because you're going to hear a testimony that I heard just, uh, you know, about last week. And it's, it's, it's really great, but sensitive testing, not just the quantitative yes or no, uh, I'm sorry, the qualitative yes, yes or no, this more sensitive testing, the electrophoresis that lets you know the actual trait, you know, whether we're talking, because there are hundreds of traits, by the way, um, S, C, D, Monroe, and the list goes on, beta thou goes on and on and on. And the more sensitive test will tell you the percentage of sickling in, in your blood and uh, and, and, and you'll have much more information than just, yes, you have it, no, you don't. And certainly rules out a false positive or a false negative. Um, in school testing and education, and this came directly from my research, we did a focus group with collegiate athletes, trainers, um, coaches, and parents, four different focus groups. And the one with the athletes, they were asked whether or not 
you know, when should you get this education about sickle cell trait? And their responses were, we should get this in high school. Some said we should get this in middle school. If we're given sex education, if we're giving home ec, we should be told about sickle cell trait. And they even went as far as to say, everybody should be tested. It shouldn't be just something that athletes need to be tested for. Because again, marching band, dance, sororities and fraternities, all of them enter into an exertional state that could be dangerous if there's a uh, sickle cell trait present. Again, the transition uh, conversation from peds to adult, and this is you know debated whether it should start at 13, should start at 11, start at 16. But again, just being mindful of this is a person that's going to you know, age out of growing pains and, 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 and still suffer with you know, muscular pain or bone pain or what have you. Um, the transition place is another place for uh, con conversation. Dating, sex ed, whenever that is, whether that's happening in school or is that you know, the favorite aunt or uncle or mom and dad, wherever that conversation is happening, sickle cell trait should be in that conversation. And here, NCAA sports, DeVard and Devon did not know they had sickle cell trait until they wanted to play football at Florida State. And th that was the one thing that was going to either allow them on the field or keep them from the field. So when they got uh, that you know, diagnosis and they were told nothing to worry about, that was their motivation. And, 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 and you, you think about two young men who've only wanted to play football in the United States. Oh, I got nothing to worry about. I got nothing to worry about. That's what I was told. But, you know, and in some instances, you know, they get to watch an eight minute video and in other instances is nothing. There's no supplemental education. So here are another, you know, here's more of that uh, um, opportunity for conversation. Again, the universal uh, precaution education billboards, you know, sickle cell awareness month is an example that we have for September, but we haven't turned the world burgundy yet with the sickle cell color. So we have a ways to go. And if you ask me, I think we should have multiple months because there's so many other, you know, there's another, there's a month for each cancer. So why can't there be a month for each trait? And then the recruitment of sickle cell allies, because everyone doesn't have sickle cell, but certainly people that don't have sickle cell can care about sickle cell, can support it, can be ambassadors and mouthpieces the same way that we see with breast cancer. Everyone's not gonna get breast cancer. Everyone's parents not gonna get breast cancer. Everyone's spouse is not gonna get breast cancer, but there are a number of varying sectors represented in the advocacy of breast cancer. We need the same with sickle cell. We call them sickle cell allies. So here, what is this picture showing us? Up at the top left, this is a group of young athletes that are practicing. And I actually took this picture myself while I was doing my dissertation research. And I got a little closer and I observed that they are you know, playing and you know, getting up a, a nice lather of sweat. And I saw no water, no water on the field. This is my own observation. Um, here we're watering our plants. The, the pets are getting water, the car is getting water. Why? Because we don't want our pets to get lethargic. We don't want our cars to run hot. We don't all want our plants to die. But in order for a human to avoid dehydration, humans must consume at least half their body weight in ounces of water daily to avoid dehydration. That is whether or not you have sickle cell. So if you weigh, 150 pounds, you should be consuming at least 75 ounces of water per day. And if you weigh 200 pounds, you should be consuming at least 100 ounces of water per day. This is how we avoid dehydration. When I make this presentation in a live audience, I ask, okay, so based on this formula, how many people in this audience are dehydrated? And unfortunately, most of the hands are raised. Uh, because we're and we're just not we're just not hydrated enough as a as a whole. Now you add sickle cell or sickle cell trait into this picture, and in in the complications that can be associated with dehydration, you have a mess. And this is something that we can do proactively 
um, and, and advocate for. You know, let's not deprive water. Let's not associate water with weakness when it comes to athletes. Um, let's not take away water, use water as, as punishment to avoid dehydration. And to address the risk factors of uh, dehydration, elevation, and uh, exertion, there are protective factors uh, where we're talking about those conditioning workouts. Sickle cell trait athletes are encouraged, and I, I believe this is applicable to any athlete, sickle cell or not, to go from rest to intensity gradually. We, we don't hit the ground running you know, at our fastest and most intense right out the gate. Work up, warm up. Hydration and proper hydration is of course the half your body weight in ounces daily, but it is also hydrating before you feel thirsty. Because by the time you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. So before you're thirsty is before, during and after, especially physical activity. If there's no physical activity, you're still consuming your half your body weight in ounces, but certainly if there's exertion and exertion can just be working hard. You have a physically or labor intensive job um, before, during, and after, and then that, that recovery. And in athletics, you know, it, it looks like putting your arms above your head or taking a knee or walking around with your hands on your hips, but it, it, it needs to be predicted and proactive recovery um, to, to be able to get your breath back and regulate your heart rate and then go back to intensity, but still going back gradually. So to simplify this, this is our mantra for coaches, parents, young athletes, and even us you know, seasoned folks is warm up, drink up, rest up. That's as simple as it gets. Warm up, go from rest to intensity gradually, drink up, hydrate before, during, and after, and rest up. Allow multiple, Allow yourself multiple recovery breaks, whatever it takes to regulate your heartbeat, heartbeat and, um, and then you can return back to physical uh, intensity or your workout is done. Warm up, drink up, rest up. These are just some of the, the resources that I've quoted today. Uh, with, these, uh, with this sickle cell trait literacy that's extremely important to me, uh, I've outlined some of the barriers that we've talked about. Of course, there is that medical training that is the, the equivalent of five minutes um, that causes the patient themselves to end up having to educate their providers of certain, you know, the stigma associations. And then there, you know, in the sickle cell home, there's sickle siblings. Uh, and unfortunately there may be sickle, uh, I'm sorry, guilt or a minimization of trait symptoms when there's a sibling with sickle cell. I hear this a lot. Um, and again, I'm not a clinician, but when we think about a, a crisis, that is not just a pain that just occurred from a tap and then it goes away. And sickle cell pain is from, is resulting from damage, from bone damage, you know, the, you know a stretching, or a, 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 a deformation of your blood vessels, that damage is compiled upon each time. So it does get worse. And so if you are a sibling and you're minimizing, or if you're a caregiver and you're minimizing, you're only setting yourself up for future issues. And then finally, the rare designation, which is a long, long debate. Uh, because how rare is sickle cell trait? It's not. So, uh, but does but the rare designation in some instances gets it more funding, and 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 in other instance, instances it is not. Um, the deaths associated are not rare enough. Uh, I mean, are, are too rare. So, I, I heard one MD say parents of a lost child don't care about statistics and you know I, and I agree. But here are opportunities again for those conversations that I listed, you know, to offer testing earlier, more sensitive testing, get better on our surveillance. Do we really know the numbers of people that are walking around and do 
We know, but do they know? Uh, research, which requires funding, and then possibly there may be therapies, there may be pharmaceuticals out there that can address things like the oxidative, oxidative stress that the trait warrior athlete is going through or per, a person that exerts. And of course, those fund, those, those pharma, uh, the more those pharmas are developed, that also creates funding, much needed funding in the sickle cell trait space. And this is just uh, the name of my dissertation, the topic that I studied uh, that gave us a good insight into how the, athlete, the young athlete feels about sickle cell trait and, 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 and their knowledge level about exertional sickling. Again, just pointing back to, is that diagnosis enough? Is that newborn screening alert letter enough? Uh, it's a resounding no, it's not. So the bottom line is from that research, we learned that education is desired, is needed, and is not widely, uh, you know, widely available. They want to know, they want their teammates to know, and they want everybody else to know. They want the uh, ally to be involved to help push this message forward. And this is another reason why, because everyone, whether you have sickle cell or not, you can still be identified uh, with the hemoglobin genotype. Uh, there is a number here listed on the bottom of this slide, but AA is the genotype for all of us who don't have sickle cell or sickle cell trait. So everyone is represented in this conversation. Even if you don't have sickle cell trait or disease, you have a hemoglobin genotype, which is AA. And uh, we, you know, the Asworn Foundation, we are starting, and I've, I've seen them elsewhere as well, but we're starting to share through our uh, gear, genotype gear. I'm an AA warrior. I don't have sickle cell, but I'm an ally. And this is just a resource that, a resource that we provide for uh, parents to print out and take to the uh, coaches um, to help them advocate for their children in the, you know, in the event that they have a trait athlete and they just want them protected and have an extra set of tools uh, to inform the, the coaches and training staff about their young athlete. And that's how you can keep in touch with the As One Foundation on all social media and website. Uh, with that, I'll say thank you. And I understand we'll have questions at the end. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rustin. That was really informative. Um, and our next panelist um, is Farhan um, Dozier. Is that how I pronounce your surname? Yes. Um, he is an advocate and founder of um, What's the Count or WDC on SCT or on sickle cell trait. Um, and happy birthday again. Thank you. Love's yours. I do have a slide, a uh, couple slides. I know I got a few minutes, so is there? Can I share the screen? Okay. All right. So again, thank you for allowing me to participate in this conversation. It is very um, important. Um, it is a personal conversation as well. Uh, I have been blessed to have Dr. Austin. Uh, as a teammate, uh, I looked for the Aswan Foundation when I, one of the very first organizations I found in 2010, and she happened to be transitioning into that organization. No one returned my phone calls. I was trying to send emails. And a few years later, we did meet and I was like, I've been looking for you. And so with her research, um, it has proven uh, to my conversation and my experiences of uh, how important uh, sickle cell trait awareness is. Uh, for me, um, I'm going to give you my story. I'm going to go from A to Z and I'm going to touch on some key points. But before I start, I wanted to share with you, for me, language is important on how we go forth in this conversation. And this is written from the medical books. Uh, it says the risk factors for sickle cell trait. And it says right there, you can read it. Most people with sickle cell trait do not have any symptoms of sickle cell disease, although, and for me, when I saw that, that means that they knew or they've known that there has been some type of complications 
with sickle cell trait because right after that, it says in rare cases, people with sickle cell trait might experience complications of sickle cell disease such as. That line right there just makes no sense to me. So as you can see, pain crisis in their extreme form and as Dr. Austin has given you um, information and research uh, about that. Another thing that I wanted to share um, as a sickle cell trait advocate, we talk about, as Dr. Austin mentioned, sickle cell trait, hemoglobin C trait, thalassemia trait, all those are very important. The test that you wanna ask for is the hemoglobin electrophoresis and they can tell you what percentage of sickle cell trait that you have. Also uh, with the test, they can also tell you um, what other inherited genes you have like sickle cell trait, uh, thalassemia, um, C trait, D trait as well. Um, and then I'm gonna hit some of these facts right here, but I'll tell you now, um, you gotta know what your status is. Again, you see the list of the different types of genotypes, uh, the cardiac arrest, uh, that can happen to with the sudden death, um, acute illness, uh, colds and flus. Sometimes people say, go to the gym and sweat out a cold. Ah, that's not always a good idea. Uh, lack of sleep, fatigue, those are one of the main symptoms that as I've been advocating people with sickle cell trait, they say, oh, I don't have pain, but are you tired? Oh yeah, I'm always tired. Yeah, well, you know what? That might be something you want to start to look at. And so hydration, food, um, with rhabdo, uh, there are certain medications. Uh, cholesterol medication can create uh, symptoms or trigger rhabdo. So it's not just sickle cell trait carriers who can experience rhabdo, but anybody exercising, but also uh, with other inherited genes as well, but also some medications can trigger rhabdo. So I'm gonna tell you just my quick story uh, from A to Z uh, in, 1975, I was five years old. Um, my arm would ache, left arm ache like crazy. My grandmother would hold me over the sink and run warm water over my arm. And that was the only thing that would soothe it. Uh, they took me to the hospital, told my parents, he's five, it's growing pains. Don't worry about it. Uh, joined the military at age 19, did my physical, uh, nothing was told to me. Uh, went about my career was having some symptoms. Uh, that arm pain never went away. Uh, talked to my mom. She said that she remember I was like two years old with that arm pain and I would be crying as a young child. So I remember five, but my mom would tell you I was two. Um, transferred to Michigan. I did my second physical in 1999 at the LA Air Force Base. And the doctor called me in a panic, like you need to come back to the clinic. And so I'm like, uh-oh, like, did y'all find some STD or something? <laughs> like, what is going on? So I, I run, I go back to the hospital and, and to the clinic. And he's like, do you know you have sickle cell trait? I'm like, no. He says, okay, well, we just want to let you know that you're a trait carrier. Um, gave me no pamphlet, no information. I remembered, hey, I have a cousin with sickle cell disease. Is, is that the disease? No, no, no. You're just a carrier. You have nothing to worry about. Um, make sure you don't make with another person. I'm like, well, I already have my, kid, my daughters, so I'm done um, having children. What? Now, that was 99. In 98, my youngest daughter, Deja, was born. I got a letter in the mail from the hospital. Looked at that letter, huh, okay, and put it away. Now, I found out the next year that I was a trait carrier. So again, we never put two and two together, um, even with my cousin um, adding three and three together, just never had those conversations. Uh, transferred to Michigan. My daughter was about two years old in Michigan and she was crying. My hands, my hands, my feet. Oh, it's growing pains. I said, uh, she's two, she's growing pains. You know, that was the conversation. So again, I've had my, my, my arm issues. I've had a doctor shoot cortisone because he said it was tendonitis. Like I went through all these different pains with my arm, just never went away. I'm 51 and I'm still having this arm pain, if not worse. In, 90, in uh, 2004, uh, 05, I was deployed uh, in states. We were training Iraqi soldiers and our soldiers to survive the roadside bombs. They were attacking the convoys during that time frame. So we brought in uh, units that were gonna go overseas to train them uh, to survive that. So during that deployment, I was having a lot of health issues. Uh, I could barely walk, my hand was swollen. The doctor gave me Motrin 
uh, you know, gave me a profile because my feet hurt. And that's how I ended that deployment in, 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 in a bad state. I did get promoted as well. And so I transferred to my next duty station in Sacramento, um, came back down to California in that short transfer and went off to my Master Sergeant Academy. So I was at E7 around my 17th year, uh, getting on the promotion list to make E8. And that morning at the schoolhouse, I got up like any other year uh, and did the push-ups, sit-ups, and was out doing the two-mile run. And we're trained to sprint that last lap. So when on that last turn, I could hear the instructor, 1545, 1546. So I'm like, hey, I'm doing pretty good. So uh, I was 36 at the time. I had 1721 to pass the test with a 60, but of course you wanna get your best score for the schoolhouse. So of course I take off and I sprint. When I look back, I remember like this electrical charge came over my body, but I didn't think nothing of it. I'm sprinting, I cross the finish line. And then next thing you know, um, 16 minutes, hand over my head to get air in my lungs, all that stuff we're trained to do but my peripherals started getting dark. And I'm like, man, I don't feel well. So I kneeled down, um, closed my eyes because I started feeling nauseous and everything started to spinning like a million miles an hour. So I closed my eyes real tight. Um, and so the medics came and got me, rushed me to the hospital. Uh, I'm in the hospital bed, doctor gives me an IV, comes back in and says, you ever had kidney problems? I says, no. He says, what do you do now? And then he walks out and I'm like, what? <laughs> So he comes back in and says, you know what, freak accident. You're probably dehydrated, heat stroke. It's like 5.30, 6.30 in the morning. It doesn't make sense, but he's like, dehydration, heat stroke. I'm gonna give you one more IV, go back to the barracks, take the day off, you'll be fine. I do that, I wake up in the afternoon and I'm worse. I'm throwing up, everything is still spinning. I almost crapped on myself, like I was in a bad state. I go back to sleep. Of course, I know it's after 4.30 because my classmates come back in the barracks and they see me and they rush me back to the hospital. The night doctor does some more tests and he sees that my creatinine kinase levels are at 12,000 and they're rising. Um, at age 36, they were supposed to be about 150. So he um, put me on IVs and ended up flushing my system out. Took him about four days for my CK levels to drop down to the 500s. I had severe muscle fatigue, um, joint pains, uh, vertigo, blurred vision, uh, could barely walk. And they sent me home. And so I get back to my regular doctor here uh, at my home base and they send me to uh, a neurologist because they were thinking that something was going on with my brain because of the vertigo and things like that. So he monitored my CK levels. Uh, I would go to the gym, but when I got off the treadmill, it felt like I was off a roller coaster. So about two and a half years of that, we realized that you just can't run. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I turned my paperwork into the military and they see my diagnosis and they saw the rhabdo and they were like, oh, you're done. We have to put you through this medical board process. I'm like, hey, that's like two and a half years ago. I just can't run. I could do you know, something else. Like I could do the walk or the bicycle. So they deemed me uh, not fit for service, uh, put me on a P4 profile, which I couldn't do any exercise, couldn't carry a weapon, do anything. That was 2009, September. By January 1st, 2010, I could barely walk. Uh, my body had started to shut down. Um, I had pains all over. My whole body was inflamed. Uh, come to find out in 2010, uh, UCLA Medical Center deemed me having arthritis. And so now I'm dealing with arthritis and my now my mental is diminishing. And so now I'm doing uh, mental health classes because I'm afraid that I'm gonna get discharged. I was on the base leaving a mental health appointment and the officer that I served with, Joseph Adams, during the war, our deployment, I hadn't seen him for five years. We passed each other on the base. He's like, how you been? I'm like, you don't wanna know. He's like, no, tell me. I'm like, man, my muscles, I'm depressed. I'm trying to, you know, just trying to figure out what's gonna happen with my career. And he says, you know what? Something like that happened to me where my muscles locked up. I have sickle cell trait. So I have to drink extra water, take these vitamins. And I'm standing there in 2010, like, why does that sound familiar? And then I remembered that physical from 1999. I go get a copy of that. Sure enough, positive sickle cell trait test. I take that to UCLA. My rheumatologist, she 
test me again. Sure enough, positive sickle cell trait. And she was able to tell me that 40% of my red blood cells were the S gene. And the research that we found with the rhabdomyolysis and all the collapse and military personnel dying and athletes dying was what I had experienced. And by submitting that paperwork to the military, they medical retired me. It took them three years to medical retire me. <sighs> to be able to share um, these conversations as, as, as how it was told to me in a passing conversation is the value of this, this dialogue. And so to know that 300 million people plus globally have sickle cell trait, to know that our allies, as Dr. Austin says, thalassemia, C trait, D trait, O A R A B, Monroe, um, all these red blood cell conditions um, also can experience a type of exertion with um, their genotype. So I've met an officer who had thalassemia um, as I was getting out of the service. He said, oh man, I had rhabdo, but I have thalassemia trait. And I, I was running, I was doing this you know, track meet and stuff. And, you know, so when you talk to people, when you share your, what you're up to, you will hear the relatedness of these conversations. So to be able to have a platform. Um, I've been able to have a college course. I was able to create a community college course, 16 hour, one credit um, in the San Bernardino Valley Community College in my city for two years. Uh, Dr. Austin came, they spoke uh, as, as guests. The students there in college were like, we should have had this stuff in high school, junior high school, like we should have known this uh, information. So it is very important. Um, so I'm, I'm just here to answer any questions. Uh, my daughter, again, has sickle cell trait. Uh, I used to think she was lazy. She was coming home from school, always going to sleep, taking a nap. What's wrong with you? Well, as we became advocates, fatigue is, is, is part of hers. And also when she's stressed out or cold, uh, her hands, her feet, and her shins ache. And so she is aware of this conversation as well. She's my teammate. We, she helps me with these conversations in our foundation. Uh, Dr. Maisha is also um, on my board. She's a doctor um, and she's also supporting us with sickle cell trait. I wanna say this before I step away is in 2017, 18, we were able to do sickle cell trait screenings here in my, in my city and, and throughout California. What we found is some people have alpha thalassemia, which is silent or also have beta thalassemia, which they have never known. So I'm asking you that if you are a sickle cell trait carrier and you do have an opportunity to get retested, um, depending on your state, when they did the newborn screening, you may not have been tested or you may have been misdiagnosed. Uh, people with sickle cell trait have, we're finding to have uh, alpha thalassemia and it could be silent or it could be the A2 is the number you want to look for. So if you look at your medical uh, blood work paperwork, look for the, your num the A2 numbers, and that will be able to determine if you have alpha or beta is what we're discovering um, with working with Dr. Maisha. And so a lot of times um, the re-education uh, is, is what I say in my organization, we're re-educating the community about sickle cell trait because a lot of people just are not aware of the risk factors mainly my experience are those risk factors. They've been taught about having the child, you know, with two parents with the traits. Um, even that is, is still a challenging conversation because a lot of people were having babies today and they didn't know they had thalassemia trait or C trait. And so to be able to know the risk factors and the options of having a child is very important. So I think I've said everything that I wanted to say so we can move forward, but Again, I'm blessed to be able to share this with you. I'm always available, uh, WDC on SCT awareness, uh, uh, dot or WC on is my foundation. Just look up my name, you'll find me. Um, I do a talk show for the last 10 years and we're still at it, um, bringing awareness um, as a team now with other organizations like the Aswan Foundation. So again, thank you for your time and I appreciate you. Thank you so much for that, Farhan. That was, thank you for sharing your story. Um, 
like you said as well, I get quite emotional hearing other sickle cell trait warriors speak. So um, thank you. Um, uh, Faustina, it's, it's over to you now. So Faustina is a sickle cell trait warrior um, and she's based in Zambia and she's gonna share her sickle cell trait story with us now. All right, um, thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? All right, yeah, as she said, I'm Faustina. And, um, I would like to say that I discovered that I was ever since. Um, so when uh, Mama told me to say when I was a child, I I had I, I was ever sickly. I was sick this month, the next month I'm fine. And so we we didn't put much effort to find out what was going on. You know? But um, I remember when I was about twelve, I really got sick that I couldn't do anything. I depended on everyone around me. I couldn't do anything. I stopped school. And I was sick for about a year. And it's actually said that they couldn't find what's wrong with me. I did almost every test. And um, there was nothing wrong, but I was sick. And um, nothing came to our mind to say, OK, let's test for sickle cell trait. And I think by that moment, I wasn't having any symptoms of, um, regarding sickle cell. So it never came to our mind to say, maybe it could be sickle cell or sickle cell trait. And um, from 2012, I was in bed or bed in hospital, out of hospital. And um, I remember in 2016, that's when I started having symptoms associated with um, sickle, cell, sickle cell anemia. Um, sometimes I, I mostly had joint pain. In um, 2016, I, I had joint pain such that my knees were swelling each and every time. And um, I had, I think it was dehydration, but we, we never knew at that moment to say, okay, dehydration would cause a, a very big problem to me. And, um, so we went to the hospital, now we did some tests and um, sickle cell wasn't included to that time. Um, after we did some tests, they said, no, you, it's just a layer, pro it's just a common problem. It's um, yeast infection. You've got a lot of yeast in your stool. Now I was given some treatments and upon finishing the treatment, everything was gone. And that was fine. From 2016, I was I got sick, but it was you know, something common that each and everyone goes goes through. So I didn't put much effort on none of my families. They they they, they were they were just say no, yeah, yeah, yeah. The girl who's always sick, I I could get sick like every month. Every month I was a baby. If not for chest pain, then it could be my arm is in pain, my um, my eyes are in pain, they were swelling sometimes, and my lips as well were swelling. So we just took it to say, no, it's normal. She's just, she, she just gets sick, just like any other child. And um, in 2020, I was actually living with granny. I noticed my, uh, on my chest, my skin was, somehow changing, it was actually turning brown. So I showed Granny to say, Granny, look, I don't know what this is. And um, I think it's um, it's spreading. Now by that time, I could feel a lump on my um, right side of the breast. And I was like, look, I think it's, it's actually associated to this thing of I, I feel on my breast. And Granny was, no, it can't be cancer. So we actually, I, I started getting married saying, now I know something is wrong. And um, in May, that's when they, they, uh, I was very sick. That's when it got very serious that it impacted my daily life. I, I had both um, chest pain, the, the skin was freezing so much, and um, my bones were in pain. 
each and every part where, where I've got a bone was in pain. Sometimes I could wake up to say, no, this finger is in pain, or my, my whole arm is in pain. It's got swollen. I went to clinic, and um, they couldn't. Uh, I remember I, I, I got some tablets, some injections, um, which included diclofenac, but nothing was happening. As I was hoping to say, they would like, no, for the bones, maybe you, it's calcium. You're lacking calcium or anything. So I took almost every vitamin. I had all the supplements I needed, but nothing was, was like getting. So that's when I go to her to, to a general hospital. And upon reaching there, the first doctor I saw actually suggested to say, look, it, I think it's sickle cell. It's either you're a carrier of sickle cell or you've got sickle cell anemia. So I did my um, full blood count test, which actually showed I've got some sickle cells in me. And then after that, I was taught to, for in order to be sure it's sickle cell trait, I was taught to do an HB electrophoresis test, which actually proved to say, yeah, it's sickle cell trait. Like, the next, I was referred to go see a rheumatology, rheumatologist, which I did, and it, 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 it never went that good, but yeah, I did see a rheumatologist, because by then I had, I had an x-ray of each and every part of my bone, because they thought maybe it's an infrastructure or something like that. I had my breast cancer tested, oh, I mean my breast, I had my breast tested for cancer, which came out normal as well. So I saw this hematologist and he was like, no, these results are fine. Yeah, you're just a carrier and there's nothing more. There's nothing left. It, it, it won't impact you and um, you've got nothing to worry about. And I was like looking at him to say, no, I'm in very much pain. And all he says is you've got nothing to worry about. And believe me to say, he did not give me anything. Not, um, yeah, back then, the, the, the doctor I saw prescribed some medications for me, which are painkillers. But with the hematologist, I saw it was nothing apart from, yeah, fine. And the next appointment he gave me was, um, I, I remember it was November last year when I actually got to, to see the hematologist. And uh, um, the next appointment, he gave me is in May this year. Just imagine the gap space. First, I'm not fine. He couldn't help me in it in any way. And the next appointment I'm having with him is in May. And um, since the hematologist, I wouldn't say I'm getting better or anything. And I think I'm actually getting weight because I'm, I've got chest pains. Each and every day, I've got something to say. This is not right in my point. This is wrong. And um, sometimes uh, I have difficulties in breathing. It actually happens at night most of the time. And, um, there was this time, actually, I remember I was, I was very sick in the round zero and PM. I texted my birthday. It's frozen for me. I don't know. Anyone else? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's frozen, frozen for me. Maybe we lost her. She froze. Uh, it, I need to it, go. It, no, oh. it came out. It was, it was um, somewhere 12. And the point thing that you like, no, it's, it's all right. You're, you're just fine. You go home. Imagine I'm in pain. And then she says, you go home. She's like, that's it. Should I go home and you're going to give me anything or an injection or something to help me come down? And she was like, no, you're just a carrier. It's nothing. And I think these guys don't really believe to say, okay, a carrier can go through so many complications. They just think maybe it's something else or what. Otherwise, it hasn't been an easy journey. It is like each and every day you've got something to, to you've got something to to say it's in pain. Literally, the day you wake up, your arms are swelling. Uh, you're, you're not fine at all. And tomorrow, the same thing happens. So I'm thinking 
we, we really have to re-educate everyone within the people and um the medical world as well has to know to say not only in um those uh, conditions that they say only can uh someone with triple cell trained uh, suffer complications because i don't do diving, diving or any of the bad nations which they say can trigger your health but i'm really sick like every day of my life it's either one thing or the other if they want they come they just come together like i can't move my hands my legs are in pain my chest is in pain as at right now you can see i'm actually on something because um, my back my back hurts a lot and um my chest is in pain i actually got up for this meeting and i think i think that's all i i can say for now now thank you for this opportunity and i'm looking forward for more of these educating meetings thank you thank you thank you so much Faustina. um we appreciate you being here and sharing your story as well um especially today as i knew that you weren't feeling very well um so i we truly appreciate um, you joining us and sharing. Um, okay, so now we have Jackie um, sharing your sickle cell trait story as a sickle cell trait warrior. Yes, um, well, welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Um, like I told you guys earlier, I was actually, as a child, told that I had sickle cell disease. So I've always been careful because, you know, me and my sister both were told we had sickle cell disease. Um, but here in like 2010, I was told that no, when I moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, because I was having trouble breathing because of the altitude change that I, I only had the trait. But going back, I've always had trouble breathing. I've always had trouble with pain. Uh, when I had my first daughter, I would wake up walking her down the street. Like we would be walking and I'm holding her hand and I don't fell asleep or just passed out walking with her and I'm still walking. I wake up like, why are we out here? Where do we, okay, uh, what's going on? You know, um, I'd be at work. I used to work in a convent. I'd wake up giving the nun a bath, like dead in the water. Like, what the, oh my gosh, walking down the wall. I would fall down the walls. I would just pass out. I even drove a school bus, imagine that. Uh, the kids be like, Miss Jackie, you swerving. Miss Jackie was out. <laughs> so it's been it's been a journey. Um, it's just been the pains. I thank God for my husband because he still rubs my hands and my feet because they are always swollen. They're always in pain. My arm always hurt. I had every chest x-ray surgery. Uh, you got angina till you got... Um, inflamed heart, uh, let's do a cardiac calf. And on, on the cardiac calf table, I actually was passed out at work. I'm a nurse and I was, I was teaching IVs to the students and the little girl gave me the pamphlet. This was in Albuquerque. She gave me the uh, thing to sign her off on her IV. I couldn't see it. I blacked out. I mean, I felt myself going dark and I was like, just give me a moment. And I'm so glad I knew the area that I walked over to the desk sat in a chair and I touched somebody and said, hey, I'm passing out. And I told them that. They rushed me to the ER and they said, oh, it's your heart. Your heart is just zooming. It's just going so fast. We got to do emergency surgery. I'm like, oh, pump your brakes. <laughs> give me give me a minute. We ain't just going to cut Jackie open. Let's figure some things out. Hold on. I'm not the normal patient. You can't just cut me open. We, you, I have to tell you some background history here. Um, and they didn't want to hear it, of course. And so finally, you know, I agreed to have the cardiac calf because back up in 2007, they had told me that I had a fast heart rate and I, I failed the stress test. I got on the little machine that you tell you to run and I got up there and said, hey, oh, nope, get down. You went from like 70 to 214 in like two minutes, two seconds. I never even made it. I just got up there. You know, I used to be a runner, so I just got, nope, get down. So I failed the stress test. And they wanted to give me medicine back in 2007. And I said, well, is my heart going fast damaging my heart? 
He was like, no, but you know, it's not a good thing. And I said, oh, well, I'll soon not take your medicine if it's not damaging my heart. So back to being in Albuquerque and passed out from it going so fast, the job was like, hey, we can't have you passing out at work. It's dangerous. So you either have the surgery to work or you're done. So I had to have the surgery. I'm on the table and I say to the people, hey, something's wrong. Hey, no, put her out, put her out. She, no, sir, my, my chest is hurting right now. Sir, understand, somebody listen to me, please listen to me. Nobody will listen. I'm telling them the day I had the surgery, something's wrong. I wake up in the middle of the surgery. I heard him say, just put her out. Just give her some, put her out. I'm like, no, please, somebody listen. Nope, they didn't listen. Guess what I woke up to? Anesthesia saying, Ms. Griffin, I need you to settle down. We're going to have to intubate you if you don't settle down. I said, well, my chest is burning. He said, I know. I just brought you back. I died on their table. My chest, when he went in, it was so irritated that when he put his equipment in, it just clamped down on his equipment and would not let go. It wouldn't pump. It wouldn't do anything. He couldn't take it out. He couldn't put it in further. It just collapsed on his equipment. And he, when I woke up and they finally, they had, he said they gave me everything under the sun. They, they finally had to uh, contact uh, the British actually to figure out, okay, so we did this for her. We did that and we haven't brought her back. What do we do? So they ended up doing whatever they, they had to do and brought me back. And um, I woke up to this man sitting in my bedside. Doctors don't do that. I woke up like my chest was burning. I'm like, uh, what the heck happened? He said, um, I've, I've been doing this for years and I've never had anybody heart collapse onto my equipment. He said, it was almost like your heart was angry. It just grabbed my equipment and it wouldn't let go. And I said, I tried to tell you in before y'all started that something was wrong. And he was like, I've been doing this for years. I've never seen this. So congratulations, you made the medical journals because nobody's ever done that. He said, we called all over to try to figure out how to fix it. And um, I said, okay, so what do we do now? He said, well, um, now you have pericarditis. Uh, I didn't walk in here with pericarditis. I got, I got pericarditis. He said, so yeah, uh, I had to be on medication for about three months for this to calm down and you can't take a flu shot and you can't do this and you can't do that. Oh, okay. So I went through that and that was supposed to remember, slow my heart rate down to where I don't pass out anymore. Guess who pass, still passes out? Yeah, didn't work. It wasn't the cause. <laughs> so now he's still going through that. Um, I was at a nail shop. I, I moved from Albuquerque to Seattle and I was getting my nails done, you know, trying to come to go to town looking cute. And in the nail shop, I didn't feel right, but I didn't feel bad. You know, and so I um, I was like, okay, this is strange. And so I paid the lady and I walked out. I had rented an apartment across the street from the nail shop because I had uh, downsized to an apartment to move. You know, you get rid of all your stuff so it's easier to move. I, I couldn't make it home. Literally, I was half a block from my house. I walked out of the nail shop, crossed the street and woke up in the rocks on the ground. Still holding my credit card in my purse, like on the ground. I'm like, what the world's going on? And I was like, oh my God. I said, Lord, please just let me make it home, please. I walked about five steps and I felt myself going down. So I lowered myself down again. I'm like, what is this? Oh my goodness. And so I, was, I got, got up again. I tried to walk again. I finally, like about four or five times, I finally made it to my door. I only made it inside the door and I was on the ground. Door, door still hanging on to the doorknob. Finally got in the house. I called my daughter. I said, I don't know what's going on. I can't, I, I just can't function. But I fell asleep in the middle of talking to her. Woke up about four hours later. I felt better. I was like, okay, well, well I'm, I'm better now. It's okay. Because <laughs> you know what? It's not going to do me any good to go to the hospital. They're going to tell me, oh, there's nothing wrong. Um, oh, you're probably dehydrated. Here, drink this water. We'll give you an IV. Uh, yeah, your blood's low, but we're, because I'm always low. It doesn't matter. I was just telling her that I just got, I was in the hospital on Saturday and um, they was like, well, your hemoglobin's nine. Okay, that's that's good for me. I mean, that's, hey, that's great. Um, 
I'm always low. So it doesn't, it's not like that's what causes it to me. I'm always low. That is, I, I still don't know my causes of that. I have a grandson that has full blown sickle cell who just got out of the hospital uh, yesterday. And I had to fight for him because they were trying to take out his gallbladder because he had gallstones. He was nauseous in the middle of the night. And nobody understands our bodies. Our bodies does not work like everybody else's body. I'm saying, why are you trying? He's, he just turned 10 a couple of weeks ago. Why are you trying to take out his gallbladder? Oh, well, he has stones. Okay, are the stones bothering him? No, they're just there. Okay, then we're not cutting him open to take out his stones. He, he's in pain 90% of his life and he's not having pain right now. You want to cause pain? No, we're not doing that. Trust me, there will come a time when that's bothering him and we can do it then. But they don't understand that our you can't treat us how you treat everybody else. They, I tried to tell them before they did my knee surgery a month and a half ago that, hey, I'm probably going to have a little bit, it's going to be a little bit different. It's not going to be the same. I have a hyperimmune system. I don't know if the rest of y'all have a hyperimmune system, but one thing goes wrong with me and everything flares up. I got joint pain, arthritis, chest pain, pleurisy. I mean, it is just, it's snowball. It's a snowball effect that I constantly go through. Um, the fatigue, you, you're just tired all the time. You know, this is my second marriage because the first one is like, you don't ever want to do nothing. I, can't, I want to, I do want to do stuff, but you know, I can't, I can't do it right now. So, you know, you just don't have it and no, nobody understand. You look normal. I mean, you, uh, you was on the phone all day long yesterday. You had no problems. So, you know, <laughs> but it's just a moment by moment thing. It's not all the time. It's just not all the time. It just, it happens when it happens. That's just the way our life is. We have no rhyme. We have no reason. There's just that moment at that time. You know, I'm a person that just lives with pain. I just do. I mean, they get mad if I go to the emergency room and I'm having, I don't know if y'all have them, but I have abdominal pains. Oh my God, they get so bad to where you just cannot function. I can't eat. I can't do anything. The last time I had it was in 2015. They tried to tell me that I had pancreatic cancer. I'm, I work GI. I'm a GI nurse, okay? They just, I'm like, cancer, hold on. What it was is certain foods set us off, you know, depending on what you eat certain foods set you off. Well, when they finally did the testing, I had to go through tons of testing to prove it wasn't cancer. Well, it turned out to be it's inflammation that mimics cancer. So they went in, it looked like I had all these tumors. Like, it was like, oh my God, you're like, your, your, your abdomen is full of tumors. You have tumors on your pancreas. You got tumors on your small intestines and it's just all inflamed and they're just, it's, it's, it's everywhere. We're probably going to have to take out your pancreas. We're, mm, take out my pancreas, hold on, slow, slow your roll. And just so happened, I had a boss to say, Jack, I just had a sister with that. Uh, she was allergic to nightshades. Do, do you eat tomatoes and onions and stuff like that? And I said, yeah. She said, well, you might want to stop. And I was like, okay. So I stopped. Guess what? It went away. It's, um, it was causing tomatoes, ketchup, iceberg lettuce. They were causing this inflammation process where, you know, like right now, if you can see, I actually broke out the um, certain foods, anything was just, it spikes up the psoriasis. I could eat something, I'll blurt out in blisters. Um, I was just telling her a day ago, they decided that, you know, the medical mask wasn't enough for me at work. Here, Jackie, wear this K95 mask. And they give me the mask and I'm like, okay, why is it itch? Is it supposed to itch? <laughs> Do y'all mask? itch my mask itch <laughs> i go to the bathroom i take off the mask my whole face i'm black y'all see i'm dark my whole face was red broke out in blisters <laughs> i can't breathe i said oh, i think i'm allergic to y'all mask the girl had to give me a little dirty <laughs> benadryl from her purse <laughs> i'm walking outside my eyes swollen i'm broke out in rash Finally, the Benadryl kicking. I said, girl, you trying to kill me with that mask. <laughs> so is you just never know. It hits you when it hits you from everything. I mean, if it's in your blood, it's going to happen. I My D-dimer, I don't know if y'all get y'all D-dimer check, 
but I have problems with clotting. I clot a lot. Like my daughter had a baby and she decided I need to stay there with her as if I had a baby, so I can't leave the hospital. So I, I end up with the blood clot in the leg from being at the hospital with her. I ended up with the blood clot. I didn't have it. Then I ended up having another blood clot. It's like every time you turn around, it's like, oh my gosh. Wait. So I have a high D dimer where my, because it sickles, it clots. It clots in my arms, in my feet, my, it hurts. Uh, I do the swelling of the hands or the feet, but supposedly I only have the trait. Uh, my sister, my youngest sister, who's never been sick now was all, they told her when she was in the army that she had sickle cell trait. She just got sick May in December, November. And I'm just like, can I look at your chart? Because she was in the hospital. She was crying, screaming out in pain. My niece called me and she was like, hey, auntie, can you look at, call the hospital? The maid is in pain and they're not giving her anything. And I'm like, okay, let me call up there. And I say, hey, let me get into your chart. So I get into her chart. I look at I said, did anybody ever tell you you had sickle cell? She said, no, I got the trait. I said, no, I'm looking at your chart. You got sickle cell. She's like, no, I, I have the trait. I said, I'm in your chart. You have sickle cell, not the trait. And so how that happened, we still don't know. This just happened. But now she has full-blown, so she was in a hospital in a full-blown crisis, screaming her arms hurt. And she thought she only had the trait. No, she got full-blown sickle cell. Nobody ever told her. She will be 50 this year. And she just found out that she has full-blown sickle cell. So it's, I don't think we, we don't know enough about it. We just don't. It's, it hasn't been studied. It hasn't been tested. It hasn't, we just have not, it's sad to say, because I'm in the medical field, we're, we have not been a priority. You know, we're just told, oh, it's a trait. Just know that, you know, you just can't have kids with somebody else that got the trait. You'll be all right. And that's not the truth. This It does hurt. It does have signs. It does have symptoms. And it does affect our everyday life. And thanks to this baby here, we have a voice to say, hey, yeah, I've been doc. I told y'all I was sick. <laughs> but you know, because don't nobody, they don't believe you. You're like, I told, I tried to tell y'all I couldn't run. You know, I used to be on track team. You'd be like, you know what, I can't breathe. Give me a minute. Oh no, Jackie, run again. Look, what part I can't breathe? You won't understand. You want me to be dead on the ground? I'm telling you, I can't breathe. So people don't understand that when you say you can't breathe, you can't breathe. Like seriously, you really cannot breathe. It's been many times I just had to just stop doing whatever I'm doing. I almost passed. I did on the day before we got married. Like seriously, we were like, nice, nice little waterfall in the park, walking around. I said, hey, we got to stop. He's like, well, I said, we, we, we got to stop. I got to sit down. I got to lay down. I'm going to get on the ground. I'm getting the grass. I'm telling you right now, it's over. I can't go no further. I'm telling you right now, I feel it. I know when I'm going down. And we, we found the park bench and I laid down and I was out. That was a day before my wedding. It's just, it happens when it happens. You don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know when you're not going to feel good. It just does. And, and it, it's a sad thing, but yeah, we are. I'm so glad to find y'all that, wow, okay, I haven't been crazy all these years and okay, it, it does affect me and it does affect my everyday life. And, but I push on, like I said, I don't take any pain meds. I just push on because you go to the emergency room, they think you're drug seeking. Oh, my arms hurt. Oh, well, what do you want me to give you? Oh, so we doing this. Okay. I don't want you to give me nothing. How about you fix it? I want to be fixed. I don't want your drugs because your drugs is going to mask what's wrong with me. So I want you to find out why I'm having the pain. Let's do that. Let's fix the pain. Don't mask it. I don't want it masked because that's all a narcotic is going to do. A narcotic is just going to tell my mind that you're not in pain. It doesn't actually get rid of a pain. Narcotics are not pain medicine. They're not. They're opiates. I want an analgesic, an actual pain medicine. So if somebody gives you a narcotic and say, hey, this is for your pain. No, it just tells your mind, hey, you ain't got no pain. No, that's not a pain medicine. It's a narcotic. It's, it's a mind altering drug. That's what it does. No, let's get to the bottom. Let's get to the root cause of my pain and fix that. They don't want to hear that. Now they want to give me the pill. <laughs> so definitely it's, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle. And I'm glad to hear all of y'all's stories and meet all of y'all and understand that it's a process. You know, it's a lifelong thing. It's not going away tomorrow. 
uh, and hopefully somebody will hear our story and start to actually listen and do the testing and the studies that we need to have done so that our children and our children's children don't have to go through what we've been going through for years. Thank you. Oh, Jackie, thank you so much for sharing your story. I felt like crying at part of it, just hearing um, when you're in the hospital, because I've had a similar experience, telling them over and over again, and nobody listened, and it caused complications, and I had a crisis really badly after that. Um, it's so traumatic, just all of our stories together. It's so traumatic, and you feel, I mean, I feel every one of you guys sharing it touches me because I've lived those experiences so thank you so much for sharing your story um I don't know if Agnes is around she's got her screen turned off I lost oh. her hey sis okay so um I'll just introduce you Agnes is all the way from Australia um and she's an advocate and the founder of ASCA is it ASCA, the pronounced Australian Sickle Cell Advocacy Service? Um, and she also hosts um, talks um, entitled Sickle Cell SCD Talks with Agnes. So um, thank you, sis. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's almost 11 p.m. here and I woke up very early. So <laughs> if I, I think I'll, I may have to run afterwards, but thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and uh, lovely to meet you all on this platform. I know a few faces, happy birthday for on. I've seen you around, but I think we've never interacted before. Nice to uh, meet you, Jackie and Sean. Um, well, I I'm listening to all this. And I think for me, the first time that all these sickle cell trait issues were very, very much highlighted was the time that I had Dr. Tomia Austin on our platform before all my life I've just felt that I'm this I know there's something wrong but I didn't think it was anything serious to be honest and even though when I was pregnant with my youngest child who turned out to have sickle cell disease I was in hospital for I think eight weeks two weeks of those I was in ICU I didn't think so much about it and I thought because she was born with sickle cell, not so much that I had the sickle cell trait, if that makes sense. So until I met Dr. Austin on my platform, that's when things started adding up. And especially all these presentations from you, uh, Dr. Austin and Peron, sort of adds up even now, as I'm sitting right now, I have constant pain on my left leg all the time. And when I tell my husband, I just feel that maybe it's the bed. I keep telling him we should change the mattress because my left bed, my left leg always hurts. I just feel it's a bed. And I said, maybe sleep on, I'll sleep on your end because I don't know why my leg, even now my left leg hurts. So my story, um, when I realized that definitely it had to do with sickle cell trait, um, I've got four kids and all the three were born okay. Two are born in Zambia, two are born here in Australia. One of them, we found out that she had sickle cell. But before that, when I was about six months pregnant, I was in hospital. And what started off like a, just a normal fever for, for three days, it's the first two days, I was just like, you know, it's just a normal fever. I took paracetamol, I was fine. The third day, the same thing happened and I'm stubborn. I don't take medication. And my husband forced me to go to hospital. It turned out it was the best thing I did because the third day that fever never went down. I was in a, in a smaller suburb. By midnight, I was being transferred to the main hospital in the city because everything just went wrong. All my, my blood just went berserk. My white blood cells went up. I was in constant pain. Before I know it, they were putting a catheter in me. I'm like, what's happening? Because my fever was just up the roof. In the middle of the night, they transferred me to the main hospital in the city and they didn't know what was wrong with me. Let's just say everyone was puzzled and, and the doctors were wearing, uh, you know, now that they're wearing the, the masking like COVID now, everybody was wearing that because they thought I, I had some sort of a virus and, you know, I was contagious. I was in ICU, but I was isolated in ICU, if that makes sense. When you are in ICU, there's different stages but I was in this ward in the middle, like <laughs> with windows so that people can see in. 
you know, it was only my husband was the one who was allowed to go in and all the doctors when they come in, they're all masking up because all my, my blood, everything was wrong. They didn't know what was wrong and they did all the tests they could on this earth, everything, including, and one of the things that they really focused on was HIV. They thought I had HIV AIDS. I was like, I've got, this is my fourth child. Are you telling me that all oh, this time and, and where is it, where has it come from? Anyway, they tested everything, the TB, TB of the bones. They took me to another bigger hospital to check, maybe had tumors in me. They put a camera inside me and nothing was wrong. The symptoms, I had joint pains. My eyes were jaundiced and I was in constant pain, like 10 out of 10 pain. I couldn't bath for a week because that's how painful my skin was. I didn't want to touch water. I was so in so much pain until my, my friends literally had to drag me and say, Agnes, you have to bath. Two, two seconds, I quickly, quickly, they, they washed me and that's it. And I would just dream in the middle of the night, I'm like, you know, the way I feel if I was back home, I'd feel like maybe I've got malaria. And the, the, the next thing I know it, the following day, they're putting me on malaria drugs. Uh, all sorts of anti, you know, um, uh, what, what is it, the, 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 the antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics, they put me on that. And because they are just doing try and error medications, I, I developed diabetes as well because they didn't know what to do. They put me on steroids, a very high dose of steroids. So I was swollen and then I developed diabetes and then I had jaundice and my HP kept dropping and they had no idea. So they just kept me there and when they started doing the steroids, for whatever reasons, the body started um, accepting and started just working slowly. And all this time, you know, I traced the doctor who, who treated me after 10 years. They never transfused me. So mm -hmm. after 10 years, I asked her that, what were you thinking? Were you trying to kill me or were you doing some form of study on me? Because I was pregnant. And I had 6.7%, I think that's how you say it in the US, we say 67% HP, and they didn't transfuse me and I was pregnant. So for whatever reasons, my, my blood started working, the, the steroids worked, but I was swollen, but the body started responding. I had diabetes, I was on insulin, and um, I got better, I started doing home visits, I think when I was in hospital for about seven months, I had pictures and I couldn't find pictures more. Sorry, next time I'll show you the pictures because I just, you can't recognize me the way I looked then. Uh, so seven months, seven, seven weeks, I started going, having home visits. And then I was finally discharged two weeks before I gave birth. My HP went up to 87%. And I gave birth to a healthy child. But they did ask me though, um, they just came one of one, one day, the doctors came around checking me. They're like, do you have sickle cell in your family? I had no idea. We don't test for sickle cell trait in Zambia. If they do, most of the, the, the children present late to, to hospital after they have um, a symptom. We don't, it's not one of the prenatal testing for, 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 you know, for in Zambia, because my first two kids were born in Zambia. My third one was born in here in Australia, but even then, that's what we are fighting for as an organization. We don't have prenatal uh, screening. We don't have newborn screening for, for sickle cell disease. So I said, no, because I had no idea. And that's it. They took my word for it. They didn't think to test my husband or to say, okay, maybe we found a sickle cell trait in you, come back after six months or so. Nothing uh, for, for them that ticked the box, they asked me and that was it. So when my daughter was born, um, it took me a year to win off um, the steroids because I was really swollen. And as, as um, if you have uh, healthcare professionals, yes, steroids, you have to win off slowly. I, it took me a year to win off that. And, uh, you know, to cut the, the story short, for me, um, after I gave, uh, I, that was a major one that, I, especially after I, I saw uh, Dr. Tomia, that was the major one that I always think about. So when I've started learning now, especially when I met Moape, then I said, now it makes sense. 
when I was at school, I used to faint from high school. And my friends uh, now that we've connected, like, what happened to you in year 12? I used to faint because I was always anemic. Mm-hmm. Even today, I can't shower for more than five, six minutes, even if I'm having like a nice shower because I get dizzy. Yep. When I wake up in the morning, I can't get up fast like that because I'm always blacked out. My blood pressure is always on the lower side. My systolic the top one is normal is about 96, 97 on the top. And if I go to the other time I went to the chemist, I was like, I don't feel well, maybe I've got high blood pressure. They tested me and I think it was 115. I was like, I have high blood pressure. They're like, it's normal. I said, no, because my normal is about 96. And as I said, I'm always in pain, especially in my left leg. Even now, my left leg hurts from here to you know the top here. I'm always in pain. But all this didn't make sense. I just thought that's normal until I met Moape. And then uh, Dr. Tommy and I've been following you also, Farron. Now it sort of makes sense that, you know, we should get serious. And that's one of the, the focus when Mwape approached me. I was like, I think this is the area that, you know, I should also focus on because we've had, when we did the Amplify Sickle Cell Voices with Dr. Tomia, we only touched a little bit and it was just one topic. But I feel that's something that we should continue focusing on and encouraging people to get tested. But also if you have these uh, symptoms, you don't take them lightly, you know, get further tests or further referrals for you to understand what's going on with your body. Um, so I've, I've said, you know, at Moape, I'm on this bandwagon. Uh, we are having the Amplify Sickle Cell uh, Voices again starting end of April. And I think um, sickle cell trade will be at least in every um, topic somehow, somewhere, we just have to fix it. And so that we can continue um, raising uh, the bar for, for, for this condition that is sort of, um, not sort of neglected. It's just, they just, even, even you know, we, we have the sickle cell warrior moms. When we come, even people that come on my platform, I'm concentrating on sickle cell disease, sickle cell disease. I'm forgetting that I should also be talking to the moms like, how are you feeling as a sickle cell trait warrior? Because that's something that has been instilled in me that I, I just felt, you know, I don't matter in this sickle cell box. I've sort of taken myself outside the box. I feel my, my job is to talk to sickle cell warriors and forget about until Moape put that bulb in my head and talked to Tommy. I was like, yes, I should start talking about this as well. So thank you so much, Moape, for, for, for inviting me. You did want me to speak about my, the, 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 the talks and the organization. So because of my daughter and because we don't have support so much in this country, I relied on um, uh, information on social media, but that didn't last long because some of the information I saw was a bit depressing. So I decided to form after so much, you know, my story, my story is quite long, but in short, I decided to form a not-for-profit organization about three years ago, which is called Australian Sickle Cell Advocacy. And our work involves us going into the community, especially in different multicultural groups, just uh, encouraging them to get tested, but also for sickle cell, people living with sickle cell disease, yeah, there's so much things that are missing in our community. That's what we're trying to bring forth to the, to the government. So during the pandemic, we, we got um, like, what are we going to do? Our organization started off on social media. So we came back and we formed another, which is also under Australian Sickle Cell Advocacy. My, my talks, which I call Sickle Cell Talks with Agnes, we just bring talks every so often. I've gone back for it now, but that's now weekly. During the pandemic, I used to do it almost seven days a week. And through that, I thought we, might, we should talk more because we are all in lockdown and most of us were not working. We decided to do the Amplify Sickle Cell Voices from August to uh, January this year. We've had a break. We are going to debrief and think of other topics, but I think with a focus on the sickle cell trait. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to join the bandwagon and just, you know, anything that I can do. And I'll just try to raise awareness and read more about sickle cell trait because that's something that I to be honest, I took myself off the, the box and thought that I'm not really affected until Marpe brought this up for, you know, for discussion. So thank you. 
it's 11.30 p.m. here, so I'll stick on for a bit and uh, just seeing one or two questions and I'll go and sleep because I've been up since six. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much, sis. I, we all appreciate you. Um, I truly, truly appreciate you being here because I knew, it, I knew it would be a bit late. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your story. And yeah, we're in this together. I think now we've started, um, you know, it's, it's just the beginning. We're gonna do great things, I think, in spreading awareness for sickle cell trait warriors and you're important, your voice is valid too. Um, so thank you. Um, our next panelist, um, who's going to be sharing her story as a sickle cell trait warrior, as well as a parent of a sickle cell trait um, child, um, is Samantha. Um, and I can't remember where you said you're based in the US, but um, yeah, floor's yours. <laughs> okay, so I'm in North Carolina in the US. I'm going to attempt to get through this without getting emotional. Um, because this is very new to me, it's still very fresh. Um, see, hearing your stories, especially with Agnes, I relate to her. Um, I was, I found out a year and a half ago that I have, well, actually a year ago, that I have the trait. Um, it was unaware to me until I had my youngest daughter, who is, as you stated, a sickle cell warrior. Um, I have two other sons, a three and a 12 year old, and they have the trait. Um, growing up, I grew up in New York. I was born in New York, um, supposedly tested and I didn't have, they sent me on my way saying you were fine. Um, I got into the military. I had every test underneath the sun, as I'm sure one of the other panelists <laughs> mentioned about all the things that we went through. And, um, I knew my partner had the trait you know, 10th grade science, we did have that little spiel. I'm sure some of you know, it's like a four square box and it says AAAS. And that's pretty much the spiel that you get when it comes to sickle cell oh, sure. and um, things that are in there. So um, we went through that, everything was fine. Uh, my two sons had the trait. And again, you get the little letter home and, you know, they say, you're fine, everything's good. Um, once they've told me that I had the trait and I really had a doctor really sit down and explain that I had it, there were a lot of bells that went off. Um, even more sitting here listening to your stories. Um, every time I went on a deployment, every time there was a change in elevation, some kind of training that I was doing in Utah or something else, I literally always ended up with an IV. Always. I, I mean, I one time we were in training, it was so cold and I was near hypothermia. They took my temperature. I was at 94. And, you know, these are things that you just think, oh, you're training. Oh, you're even a basic training. I had pneumonia. I'd never been uh, that kind of sick before in my life. And you just think, okay, it's your body. It's acclimating. You know, you're not used to working out so much. You're not used to doing that. And that's what it is. And that's, you start giving yourself reasons as opposed to really understanding what's happening with your body. Um, listening to your stories, I'm like, I'm here because of God's grace. Because every, I mean, <laughs> I've had so many IVs. I've questioned people before they touch me on whether or not they know what they're doing because I've had people collapse my veins trying to get um, water in me or, or take blood. So um, it's just, um, <sighs> I have a son who's 12 and like the other panelists said, listening to you guys' story is really opening up my eyes to a lot of things. Um, same thing, I thought he was being lazy. <laughs> I was like, dude, you, hello, sir, what do you mean? You, you, you have one job, which is cool. You ain't that tired. I need you to at least do your own work before you take your nap. And um, in discovering that my youngest has sickle cell, it's really um, giving me a lot of information that I didn't have before. Uh, my now 12 year old, his checkup. Now I'm talking to the doctor. Hey, he has the trait. I need you to point out to him what he needs to understand because I'm learning as much as anyone else. And you are supposed to be the subject matter expert. We're supposed to be able to lean on you for information, which unfortunately is not the case. Um, but fortunately this last time he, we have him with a new doctor who is, uh, 
a little bit more versed in sickle cells. So he was able to actually point to his body and says, hey, if this hurts, it's growing pains. If this hurts, it's sickle cell. It's the trait. You need to hydrate. You need to watch this. You need to do this, that, and third. And um, there are a lot of things that are being uh, done. Could there be more? Yes. I will say that um, I don't know if it's for more people talking or more people being affected. In my opinion, it's because more people are being affected. Um, not to bring race into it, but U.S. is really considered a melting pot. Um, there are a lot of multiracial children that are being born and those genetics are being passed down. So now it's no longer just um, African-Americans that are really being singled out for this because there are so many children that have this gene that's starting to be affected, which is why I think it's becoming more of a scale. Um, I actually just read an article a couple of months ago, our United States Army will now do sickle cell trait testing upon entering the military that's part of the panel, which should have been before, but you can't dwell on what should have been. You kind of just have to go from what happened today. And um, I'm First, I, I'm like I said, I'm really trying not to be emotional because you guys really are opening my eyes to a lot of things, whether it be with my family. Um, my partner has the trait. He's in Alaska right now and it's cold. <laughs> it's cold up there, but he is like, you know, hydrating and he's running and, you know, it freaks me out because he's still active duty military. Um, but he got tested for something completely unrelated to anything and the doctor called him in the same way did call him in it was like hey do you know he had the trait and he's like yeah we know he came home he was like I was like yeah I'm good I got tested they said I'm good even after my last child was born I went back and raised my hand I was like um I need to get tested for the sickle cell training. I want to know what I have. And they tested me and said, uh, no, you don't have the trait, you're good. Listen, I have this whole baby who I know is mine. She has the same little flap on her ear when she came out, I was there, this is her. They are telling me she has sickle cell and 10th grade science is telling me that I have to have the trait in order for this to happen. So you sitting there telling me that I don't have the trait something's amiss, something's wrong, I don't understand, but we need to go back to the drawing board. And it was actually her doctor that made it make sense. As an adult, you, like, uh, I think it was Jackie said, they, they look at you like you're out for something when, when really you just wanna understand. There are things happening to your body that you don't understand. And you go to your medical expert for help and they're looking at you like, oh, you just want this or you, no, I want understanding. I want you to tell me what I need to do so that I am in peak physical fitness to help my family because that's where we are now. Um, so being her advocate is, um, I will say has changed the direction in terms of what I wanted to go in. Um, I wore that uniform for 15 years and um, it, it took a lot for me to take it off. And now with her and my other kids, it's just kind of really showing me how much further we have to go. Um, not even just in this country, listening to your stories and understanding that newborn screenings don't happen in other countries like that. That blows my mind because that's all I knew. That nice little letter that I got in the mail for my two sons. And then when they told me about my daughter, they called me on the phone, you know, and they were like, hey, your daughter has sickle cell. Okay, well, now I have questions. And that doctor literally cuts me off and says, your pediatrician will contact you, speak with them. Okay, so you're the one telling me she has this disease, but you have no information for me. And then I go to the pediatrician and the pediatrician tells me, yes, she has sickle cell. We're going to start her on penicillin, which in my opinion is a strong antibiotic. <laughs> So I'm already freaked out because now I have to give her medication every day. And I ask that doctor, the pediatrician about sickle cell. And she tells me, oh, wait, we're going to send you to a hematologist. So it literally took me about three or four doctors for someone to really hear me and answer my questions. So um, the trait 
is now starting to become a component for me because maybe it's because I'm getting older. I don't know. I have pains and everything else. And like, um, Dr. Please don't hate me because I can't remember the name. But um, like she was saying, at this age, it's not growing pains. At this age, it has to be something else, you know. But after spending so long in the uniform, I'm like, okay, well, what is it? Is it, is it because I was, you know, running or I suffer from migraines, all kinds of stuff. And it's, it's really, um, I want to say you guys have inspired me to go back and get retested and get more sensitive testing I was put out because there really are a lot of questions still for me. I'm still very new <laughs> to all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I really do just appreciate your stories. And um, I think that's about it for my spiel of my experiences. Um, I actually have a heater on right now. And I think my partner who's behind me is about to kill me because she stay hot and I stay cold. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn this good thing off. <laughs> but um yeah i appreciate you uh letting me come on here um i'm gonna hate that too i'll show you it's a little here it was getting oh my together. god <laughs> seriously <laughs> we need to go back and do more studies seriously yes. i think uh yeah dr tomia you have to tell me which direction because i'm about to start my phd I need to focus on these hey. things. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Yeah. The heater, the pajamas, the yes. gown, the gown. <laughs> yes. And then pain, the skin pain when it's cold. Oh yes. my goodness. Yes. Yep. My knee is throbbing right yes. now. Um, yes. when I when we started this this morning, I was at home and I, I took myself off video before you could see the blanket that was going on on my legs um, <laughs> that I had made, okay? Because yeah. it, the blackest, the blankets I was buying wasn't thick enough. So I went to that good wow. fabric store and my friend actually made me one because she was like, you always are cold. And I was like, everywhere, it does not matter. Yeah. If there is a breeze, if the yeah. wind, it is, I am freezing. So <laughs> she actually made that blanket for me. But um, yeah, so I appreciate um, being asked to be part of this ass, ass. Sorry, it's the New York accent. You're going to get asked every time. I try to change it. It, doesn't, it just comes out. Um, <laughs> but I appreciate the platform for me sharing my story. Oh, thank you so, so much, Samantha. Um, I'd said to Agnes a, a while ago as well that I'm always wrapped up and I think I said to you Jackie this morning that I'm always wrapped up as well because I've got my scarf on, I have my fluffy gown, I've managed to avoid my electric blanket today, normally it's on my legs, um, but I have fluffy socks on and yeah, I'm in a really, really warm office as well in the house so um, I have to be warm every time. Um, Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and our panelists, um, we are on time actually. Um, so Sean, you are our panelist that has a picture and um, there is an additional panelist who um, was, was invited to participate um, and we have time for. So um, Adenike will be joining us as well after, after Sean. So um, you are an advocate. Uh, sorry, a sickle cell trait warrior um, and an advocate for your sickle cell trait child. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Perfect. And you're based in Toronto. Or Toronto, Canada. Thank, Thank you, Mopi, you. for the invitation and for the opportunity to share my story. This has been very new for me as well. And it's been amazing to hear your other stories and to hear from Dr. Tomia. Um, I'm sickle cell trait, as Mopi mentioned, and I've known like I remember knowing this always. My mom was a nurse, so she always uh, told me about this and she was always extra cautious with me because I was a smaller baby, lower percentile, and I was very sick as a baby. I, I hear within my six months, I almost died on a plane trip to Jamaica um, when I was just, yeah, just six months old. So it's always been something that I've had in the back of my mind. I knew I had to be careful exercising in, in high heat and high altitudes and even when scuba diving, which I've done. And I always imagined that as a trait carrier that half of my blood cells were sickle shaped 
like always, and not being able to hold as much oxygen as the other half. So I always thought that when I'm exercising or running or or doing any kind of output that my body would have to work harder to produce that same amount of output. But whenever I read about this, I, I would hear that, no, I should have a normal mm -hmm. body and I shouldn't have any symptoms or any complications unless I was in these extreme modes. So this is what I thought going through, but I, as I've been hearing more stories and more, more, um, I guess symptoms from you guys. I, I'm I'm hearing more of my own story in them, and it's amazing. Uh, I remember even one incident that I think maybe could be related to sickle cell as well. When I was back in grade one, we had to do fitness um, trials, I guess, to see what our fitness level was. One of them was you had to do a pull in a pull-up position, and I did this for the lot of the time. But when it was time to come down, I could not unlock my arms my my <laughs> biceps were completely frozen my whole thing i can move my hands but i could not release they had to get two teachers to lift me down and i could not open my arms just like this i could not open them for hours mm. nobody knew anything about it and i wasn't taken to the hospital but it was just a muscle cramp could mm. this have been sickle cell i don't know and then there's been other times as well <laughs> yes. <She's> a, <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there's been other times as well with the um, with the uh, extreme fatigue. Through different parts of my life, I've had bouts of extreme fatigue for months long, where I could do I could sleep for 16 hours a day, no matter how much I slept, I would still wake up and feel completely exhausted. And yeah. I went to doctors, they couldn't explain this. I got sent for a sleep testing study. They thought I had sleep apnea, like my brother and my father. I, my sleep, I slept like a baby. That wasn't it. And they kept doing tests and tests. And eventually they found that I had low iron. And I think this could also be tied to sickle cell because your body needs more iron because you're producing more red blood cells that are getting uh, destroyed in, in a shorter cycle. So I, when I feel lethargic and low energy coming on, I try to supplement with iron, but I, I heard from Jackie that this could be also an issue of taking too much iron and that your iron levels in the blood test might not actually right. reflect properly. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning so much <laughs> and it, it's been quite the, the journey since I've, I've joined these groups and I thank you all for, for doing that. Um, there's also issues with my kidneys, which is also tied to, to uh, sickle cell. In my early 30s, I had uh, high blood pressure, unexplained. They did all kinds of tests. They sent me to a nephrologist. They did scans on my kidneys. They found some benign cysts on them, which now I'm thinking I should get checked up again. Uh, but they couldn't find a reason for the high blood pressure and wanted to put me on medication. I decided to try to lose some weight and change my diet, and I was able to get it down through diet and exercise, but it's been a battle trying to keep that level of blood pressure down. And then the, the pain, like I feel pain, it's, it's in my normal, and I thought it was normal. Mm -hmm. Just when exercising, if you don't warm up properly or I do weight training, and I find if I have like a week off of weight training, when I come back to it, even if I warm up and do the weights the next day or the day after, <laughs> I can't, I can barely walk. Yeah, It's, it's like a delayed onset uh, muscle soreness, but it's every time. And it doesn't matter how much you lighten the load or anything like that. And there's just times when I'm exercising and I feel pains and cramps. And there's times when I don't exercise, and I'm not doing anything to explain it. I still have muscles. Like my muscles are my big muscles are always hurting and arms, legs, I, I feel it all the time. And I always thought this is a normal thing, but I'm thinking now more and more that it could be, um, yeah, sickle cell. Mm -hmm. And then with my son, who's also sickle cell, my father had it, I had it, and my son has it. And there's been certain things, he gets leg cramps as well. He'll wake up in the middle of the night and he'll come and it will have to massage his legs until the, the pain subsides, but no reason. And even certain, he has a lot of allergies and I have allergies, but 
we, we found that a certain allergy medication, Reactin, when he takes that, without a doubt, every time he will have a leg cramp that night, just having one dose of it. But other allergy medication, it's fine. We've ex told this to doctors, they look at you with blank faces. <laughs> They're like, okay, <laughs> don't take that one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but what else? There's, there's I, I guess it feels like there's so much that people don't know and it needs to be looked at more. And I feel that there's things that we could be doing more to help our natural state, to help with the pain. Mm -hmm. What there's, there's gotta be something else. Like there's, there's things that show up in my blood that is unexplainable. I've, I've had high creatine in my urine and my blood. I've had, um, what else? Uh, I think uh, low nephrotils, and my dad had this as well, unexplainably. And also, what else? Yeah, there's various ones that, that the doctor has no explanation for, but they constantly show up in my blood work. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll be fine for one, one test, and then the next test is it's not. So I think there definitely needs to be more study. And now with the advent of COVID, they're saying that there's a lot of overlapping symptoms and, and situations with COVID. And they're still figuring out COVID. And now when we're mixing together sickle cell, mm -hmm. people with sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait, there's situations where COVID causes low oxygen. And when you have low oxygen, you have COVID sickling. So, and there's vascular issues with happens as well with sickling and now COVID as well has vascular issues. So when we mix these things together, there's unknown circumstances. I don't think it's being looked at enough, um, but people are not, not talking about it and looking at it. But I think there's also been said that people of color and which are more, uh, more known to have sickle cell trait and disease are suffering more of COVID as well, having lesser or worse outcomes. So mm -hmm. I think all of this compounded could be uh, more reason why we need to look into this. But again, thank you all for what you're doing. It's, it seems like it's eye-opening for me to, to hear your stories. And I'm, there's things that I want to try. I'm, I'm feeling cold as well, and I've never even thought of that as something to do with sickle cell. I, I do a lot of running. I, I'm a, a trail runner. I do long distances and running here in Canada, I run all year round and I run in temperatures that are minus 20 degrees Celsius. So it's, mm. I have to be careful. I, I realize that circulation in the colder weathers can cause problems and pains and stuff like that. And now I'm thinking in my mind how I have to adjust to, to better right. prepare for that. So again, thank you, Mape, for the opportunity for sharing my story. I'll I'll, I'll pass it on for the next panelist. <laughs> good night. Thank oh, you good so day. Much, Sorry, Mom. I have to to go to bed now. Thank you so much, Mape. I'll watch the thank rest you. of the recording. Yes, uh, I'll send it day. to all of you. Thank you for joining us. This sleep well. The rest. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, just as you were talking about running, I, I was a, a keen runner. I was in the gym 24-7. Uh, um, and I remember in running in winter a few years back. And um, I had this, I missed the last bus home on Christmas Eve, um, 2012, I believe it was. And I had this stabbing pain in my hip joint. Um, I had to stop running. And by mm -hmm. the time I got home, I ended up... Um, just drenched the snow had just drenched me I had I had windproof sun um, but not really not really I guess it wasn't warm enough I thought I was mm -hmm. um, and I was I was in agony this the next morning I woke up and I felt like I had the flu um, but during the night I called my mom she was living in Holland and I called her and I was just crying because I was in so much pain the next morning I couldn't hold I couldn't cook Christmas dinner properly um, I had to ask for help to even um, just to kind of slice the the turkey. Um, I think mm -hmm. it was actually a chicken because I, I didn't 
go shopping on time I was working out of out of the city that I was based in so um yeah just thinking back to running and all these things yeah. we just don't know I, I um, haven't yeah I haven't run in a week actually the last run I was on 2k into it I felt a sharp pain in my calf and I couldn't run on it I had to walk home <laughs> and I haven't run since just trying to rest yeah yeah, yeah. it's, it's I crazy do, I do know when I was in the military um mm -hmm. my belly my belly rubin count they thought I had liver disease and so mm -hmm. every time I got sick or That's go to the doctor she would do my blood work and my my she's like your liver and so she'd make me go home and go fast and wow. then I would fast and then I would go back and she said, well, there's, they dropped a little bit, but they still seem high. And mm -hmm. I, again, not, I wasn't doing this work. So I had no idea. I'm like, I don't have no liver disease, but <laughs> yeah. she always panicked um, when they, when right. she did my yes. blood work. Yeah, my same liver. with my doctor. They'll, they, they see the high marker. They say, okay, go home. We'll test again in a few weeks and yeah. see if it's again, and then it might be normal. And then the next year I come back, it's high again. So, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you that, Sean, because you said, I want to ask you that because you kept saying that the stuff, your symptoms, and I was like, I wonder if they said something about his belly rubin count. So that's yeah, why I, I did get that, that as well. Out. Yeah. Wow. And mine, mine was the opposite where I would end up either collapsing in the gym and then I ended up with kidney problems. And they said I had paleonephritis when I went into the hospital um, to the um, A&E department, the accident and emergency department. And they said to me, if I'd have gone any longer not going in I'd have ended up um, with septic shock and could have died and that was a shock and it's only now this past year just figuring out what it all relates to and it's like wow this is it's dangerous not knowing knowledge mm -hmm. and and being able to do something about it is really empowering um, and sharing our stories is just the, the first step so wow thank you for sharing your story Sean um, and our next panelist is Adenike. Um, she's joined us and will be sharing her sickle cell trait story as well. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thanks for having me. I was not going to, it's the first time I'm sharing my story openly. So just bear with me. Um, I'm, I'm in awe of how much blood has been taken from her all of us, how, how many tests we've had to go through for. It's just so nerve wracking when anytime I go back to them, it's always about blood tests. And the nurses, they know me already. So when they see me, they say, another blood test? I'm like, yes, <laughs> because we still don't know what is wrong with me, <laughs> you see. And that has been my experience. Um, so I'm originally from Nigeria, and now before I go to the UK, well, we have an awareness in Nigeria because there's a large number of us. It's, it's quite common. Um, but the part that is really, really stressed the most, the focus is do not marry another person who carries the gene. Otherwise, you see, you're extending the issue. So all our focus is I'm not going to date anyone who carries the gene. I'm not dating anyone. So it was just all about dating in our head. You see? So, and we, you know, we broke a few hearts and then our hearts were broken. And then <laughs> it's just always been like that. So all my experience for me as a child, I've always been very fragile. The weak one at about 11 year old, I had bone deformity on my legs from nowhere. I had straight legs normally, and then somebody just, because I happened to, you know, I lost my parent quite early, so I had to live with a lot of people. So nobody was really looking after me in that area. But one of the neighbors said, one of those days that, I've been noticed that this girl's leg is curving, and I'm like, was that me? And then before I realized that they were actually talking about me, I didn't even know it was until people started telling me that, what is wrong with your legs? Your legs are curving in. And well, I don't know, if, now that I'm thinking back, it could have been maybe lack of a particular vitamin or something going on, but nobody knew anything. I was just living like that. So it got to a point, um, in fact, when I was in uni, I remember passing out twice and they rushed me into the hospital. <laughs> and then I remember I hate shopping. I don't go to market at all. I just have to walk just about a few miles and I'm gasping for breath. Mm -hmm. And I'll sit down. Normally my sister would just call me the lazy one. 
not wanting to do anything, you see. Mm-hmm. And so I've been used to hearing all of these things and you know, psychologically, now when I re- think back to these things, it just you know, gives me a whole lot of emotions that I'm trying to deal with now. You know, it's almost giving me PTSD, thinking back, remembering all the things I had to go through. You know, and um, when I came to the UK, I had my first baby. And I remember there was a particular day, I was almost out of breath. And I kept ringing the emergency services. I said to them, that I'm, I can't breathe. And the nurse was like, no, you can't breathe because you, can't, you are still talking to me. I'm like, I'm really serious. I am struggling. I cannot breathe. And she said, well, just lay down. Um, it's just the anxiety. It's the first pregnancy. I, I rang my husband that there's something going on with me. I can't really breathe very well. And he rushed home. And um, eventually, they had my blood done. They said, oh, it was lack of iron. Yeah. And they rushed me to the hospital. And this issue of... Um, sickle cell trait was never brought up until I had my last baby and the same issue was presenting itself again. Ox- low oxygen, pain all over my, my body. In fact, pain is, is a normal for me, like this is just normal. normal. Yes, I live with it. My arms can decide to just go off and then my legs can decide to not want to do anything. <laughs> and like my husband will practically lift me. Like sometimes I just lose my legs and he will practically have to leave. And I knew in my head that I just have to marry right. Like I need to marry the right person if not, I'm going to really <laughs> suffer. <laughs> so I've always been writing things down. Like, you know, you're very fragile. You know that you need to do things right. So. And the stress of even living like that is really huge on me. So, and I think that's where I started looking at the psychological parts of living with sickle cell traits. And for me, I think that um, the researches that are out there have not done us so much good because I think it downplays our experience. So you will read that well. Even I'm talking about NHS websites like the most trusted websites. They will say sickle cell disease is blah, blah, blah. And then you can carry the traits, but there's nothing wrong with you. And those, when the doctor sees that, well, that is it. They don't want to listen to anything anymore. And I've been struggling with that just for them to listen. So now I'm collecting letters, having to ring them to make a demand because now I have a child who is a carrier as well. I don't want my baby going through all of this. And until I met with <laughs> with Lulu, I didn't have an idea that I can, you know, there are a lot of us, I didn't know, I didn't even want to talk about it, you know, with the doctors, I didn't want to raise it because they don't even understand it here in the UK, as a matter of fact, the doctors will look at, some of them will be looking at you like, what is that, you know, and then you have to start educating them, it's really stressful, my fatigue, I can sit down here now and just sleep off. Like <laughs> I will just sleep off. And um, I also remember that my back, there was a day I was, I was still working, you know, somewhere in Manchester. I, w- I was just, I left the train and I was just about going up, you know, into, you know, where you get out from the train, you want to go up into, you know, into the arena. And my legs just gave way. I couldn't. Sorry, baby, I'm coming. I'm sorry about that. I couldn't move up. I couldn't do anything. I just stood right there. My legs just couldn't move. And I had to bring, I had to call one of those guys, you know, you know, those guys that work at the, tra- the rails to say, please help me. I can't move my legs. And he said, are you okay? Should I call the ambulance? I'm like, I don't know. I just can't move. You can just help me. Just lift me up. You know, and you know, he called one of his colleagues and he helped me up. And um, I got to work that day. I couldn't sit, I couldn't stand. I was, I was feeling very nauseous. You know, sometimes it's just constipation. Sometimes it's diarrhea. It's a whole lot of experience for me. Sometimes I can't even put them. I was doing um, symptoms log, and I ran out of symptoms really i said if i give this one to anyone they won't believe anything is wrong with me you see so that has been my experience i cannot take any kind of breeze my eater is always on 
my bones are always aching. Even my oh, finger, no. my fingernails. I don't know if you get anyone gets that. Yeah, my toes. Mm -hmm. So oh. yeah, that is where I am at. Nothing has been done as of yet. So I've been. I was diagnosed with um, secondary fibromyalgia or something, mm -hmm. and I was placed on. Um, yeah, zapping. I was placed on a few medications, and I said to myself. I'm just 40 years old and I'm about to get on all these meds. <laughs> you see, when we don't even know exactly what is wrong with me. Like it's, it's entirely wrong. We, we can't, can we get to the bottom of this so that we can then find a way to help ourselves, whether holistically or, or whatever. Let it be on record that I have this thing. And then even this zapping, the first time I took it, I was, was actually giving me you know, I was low on oxygen. Some of these meds are not even good for us as well, you see. So that has been my experience. It's been so, so hard on me personally, um, realizing that I have to live almost like this for the rest of my life. I think that's where I am at right now. I'm still trying to use, you know, all the resources that I have to be able to help myself to be mentally stable. You see, I think is for me is a psychological part, you know, more like um the pain is always there, but I'm trying to deal with the psychological part of this. Yes, now. So thank you for this opportunity. I I really do. It's my first time sharing with everyone. I know I'm talking here and there. Hopefully next time when we meet, I'll be more coordinated, you know, and no, talk about fine. my experience. Thank you. You're fine. Yeah, that mental piece is definitely. Um, just as important as our as our trait crisis and our trait issues. That's the human being, you know. That's everybody deals with some type of mental health uh, conversation. So it's not just isolated to us, but it does impact us on, on a different level. So yeah, definitely. Sure. Especially with the the fatigue, I think with the no energy to do anything, it kind of puts yeah. you into a cycle. Yeah. With the mental. Yeah. And then and as she as she mentioned, like just her environment, like when you don't know and, and people around you are like, uh, what's wrong with you? It's like those, those uh, they call it the limbic system. The limbic system is where emotions and short-term memories mm -hmm. are centered. So silent traumas happen yes. in that part of the brain. So it's not always something traumatic that has to happen for a PTSD mm -hmm. or, or these kind yeah. of issues. So it's, it's a human being, it's a, it's a human being flaw. And that's something that, that me yeah. personally, I wanna make sure I, we take care of that conversation. So thank yeah. you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, especially with pain, our body counts the score. You see, if even if our memory loses something, our body knows exactly. and it remembers. So exactly. even if you're not, so you will need to look at that area, look after the mind as much as we are trying to look after this pain. We need to always ensure that the mind is in the right place as well. I know it's mm -hmm. hard to do. It's something we need to figure out. You know whether we have to create a platform for ourselves. You know to be able to create to see a very safe place where we can talk therapeutically. You know mm -hmm. as a form of intervention. So. Um, um, yeah. yeah, it's something we can look into. I do struggle with brain fog as well. I, I forget things yeah. quite a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so we we are working is. that out. I, um, I just want to say, as uh, also someone who's very new to, to learning a lot, I, my heart goes out to you when you talk to doctors who don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, I had a talk with Agnes a week ago, and that was my whole thing was you get ingrained um that the doctor is supposed to be the know-all you know and and a lot of them do have mm -hmm. god complexes if we're being completely honest so when you when you go to the person who's supposed to know and they either one don't believe you two don't know so they try to pass it off it does it does break you down but i'm glad that you found us here. I'm glad that you found this platform. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't speak for everyone, but after hearing everyone, I will assume that they will co-sign with what I'm about to say, but we are here. You're always more yeah. than welcome to reach out to us. Um, I also have a young child that is just as uh, lively as yours is. That's why I was like, oh, look at the baby, because my, my partner actually said, look at Folly, because my son's name's for Folly. And he, if he was anywhere near here, good child, y'all y'all would have heard it, okay? <laughs> it would have been all, all the way live. So um, we're here, you're no, I don't want 
anyone to walk away from this, whether it's a panelist, um, because what I'm hearing is that a, a lot of it is new to us. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of communities that are out there. Mm -hmm. Even the communities for us were more looked at as advocates for the sickle cell disease, as opposed to what we're going through. Mm -hmm. And um, opening my eyes with a lot of things that you guys have, have spoken about today. I just, if no one, if anybody takes anything away from this, mm -hmm. it just needs to be that you're not alone, that we are here. And I'm always, I mean, I'm on Facebook all the time. Most of my business is on Facebook. So I'm always there and I, various hours. I also have the sleep problem. So I don't sleep much, um, but I just, I, my heart goes out to you. And I'm glad that you found this panel and were, was mm -hmm. able to share your story with us because we we do appreciate it yeah. greatly. I, I do want to say something because uh, as I've been advocating for the last 10 years, I've met people with sickle cell trait mm -hmm. who also have a glucose deficiency called G6PD. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if- mm. and people Someone mentioned that in the group the other day. Has, has tested yeah. for that. It, it could cause you to pass out as well um, because of certain types of certain types of foods um, and medication can I'm trigger drink that. water right now. So wow. it's, it's called G6PD, the glucose uh, deficiency. Um, so you can ask your doctors to or or look at your paperwork to see if, it, oh, if you've done that test. But I met yeah. people with sickle cell trait. Uh, I had a friend, uh, my coworker, who came back from Iraq. What got done with his deployment? They they brought like him and four other soldiers in a room and said, and gave him this pamphlet, said, do you know you have G6PD? He was like, what? <laughs> so- Oh, it's a damn pamphlet. Right, from the Sorry. deployment, <laughs> yeah. From the Afterwards. deployment, he, ex <laughs> he, was, he found out that he was a, also has G6PD and he has sickle cell traits. So I've met quite a, a couple of people, I won't say quite a few, huh. but I've met a few um, military personnel who have had, and my friend, my, my other friend, he was <laughs> passing out. He was literally passing out mm -hmm. at his home, not understanding like, why am I passing out? And so, you know, as an advocate, you know, I took responsibility for a lot of this conversation. And when I found out about G6PD and we did research, mm -hmm. um, certain medications and certain foods can trigger that glucose deficiency and you, you can pass out. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for letting us know that because yeah, I'd never heard of G6PD. Um, I, I want to say thank you to um, Mike as well, Adenike, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today and for, for being here. Um, we appreciate you and yeah, I, I want to just reiterate what Samantha said as well, you know, we're all here to anyone who's watching um, and, you know, been here as an attendee as well, we're here. Um, I can see a message um, in, the, in the chat um to Carl I'm not sure if you're part of the the group but um you're welcome to join the the sickle cell trait um support and information group um global voices united on Facebook um you're welcome to join us if you're not already in there um and anybody else who's who's either interested in learning more about sickle cell trait or who is a sickle cell trait warrior or who has sickle cell trait but hasn't experienced any symptoms as yet because it isn't benign there are circumstances like we all know that you know we mm -hmm. can all experience crises if we're not already suffering um or if we haven't already experienced pain I, um, from it so i think one thing is just realizing that some of the stuff that you're feeling could be sickle cell i'm still yeah like being blown away at uh the stuff that i'm used to feeling every day and thinking this is normal that everyone would feel this type of right. symptoms. yeah but we have, that they're more common we, with we, we, we have to remember too that we also inherit you know 46 chromosomes from our parents yeah. you know so there could exactly. be other things but what yes. i tell people is make sure that if you have trait rule that out so yes. then you can start looking at other things because sickle cell Definitely. trait can cause secondary health issues so it's Definitely. not always sickle cell trait related but if you're a carrier we tell hey make sure you rule that out and then start looking mm -hmm. at whatever else could be going on in your DNA because yeah. you know sometimes it's, it could be hidden. Like I said, a lot of people that we've met recently mm -hmm. have had A2, and A2 could be alpha thalassemia or beta thalassemia, depending on those numbers. So mm -hmm. may, many people may have been misdiagnosed yep. and have sickle cell 
a, a form of sickle cell disease and think they only have the trait. And so wow. the, A, the A2 is very important to, to start to look at. We, uh, for my son, we actually didn't hear, I told uh, before we started, but mm -hmm. we heard when he was about three, when we saw a dietitian that he had mm -hmm. sickle cell trait. We, we never heard that uh, from his birth screening, which we do here in Canada, but mm -hmm. they never informed us. And even that uh, we had lots of pediatricians, well baby visits. It wasn't until he was three years old that we were seeing a uh, dietitian who's looking through his thing and said, hey, did you know your son has sickle cell trait? And I knew about sickle cell trait. So mm -hmm. we were like, what? <laughs> Yeah, it was a big surprise. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, uh, Sean, what you said earlier, um, you said your son has problems with uh, allergy medicine. Yeah. I actually have a, I, I take Benadryl because sometimes I have to, yeah. but it actually causes like a restless leg syndrome. Like I take it and then my legs are kicking and hurting. So when you wow. said that, I was like, oh my God, that, yeah, that, wow. it does it to me too with Benadryl. I still take yeah. it though. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's, it's you know. Yeah, that's true. I know. I remember there was some um, some meds that I, that was actually given that caused me to um to vomit quite severely, like very bad ones. That um and then they had to like strike them off for me as part of my uh, allergy allergy med. So I never even knew about that before mm -hmm. until yeah mm -hmm. about two years ago that I was allergic to some <laughs> some meds. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole lot of experience and unfolding events as well. So I think we just need yeah. to open ourselves up. I think the, um, the, 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 thing, the major harm that has been done to us really is the fact yeah. that we've yeah. been told that this means nothing. But at, yeah. the, at the end of the day, it means a lot. Right. Yeah. And the time we've that, lost, yeah, the pain, exactly. that, and, the pain and mentally. Is, also. Mentally, and that is the general rule, even up until now. Like mm -hmm. I met with, you know, a, a sickle cell carrier and you're trying to tell them that, well, as a trait carrier, I'm actually very symptomatic. And they say to yeah. you that, and no, you should not be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yes, for sure. Just, and you always feel that, but we, we, we all have, we all have people with sickle cell disease in our yeah. lives. So we know the type of pain and a lot mm -hmm. more yeah. symptoms, at least more yeah. than me. I, some of you guys have, uh, it seems more severe actual episodes where I have kind of like a, like a static always pain. I don't mm -hmm. get like a sharp mm -hmm. onset and offset of pain, but I think always that in our mind, we, we think, well, at least we don't have the disease, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We only have the trait, so it could be worse, right? Yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm actually, I can be mystified, you know, at the thought of your the provider, your, your doctors, the, the persons that took oaths to do no harm can, um, be insensitive. Mm -hmm. I don't choose to labor on that side of it. Uh, the, the facts are that they are not educated enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have good news. And the good news is that the Aswan Foundation, along with some of our really strong partners here in the US, we are, and I believe it's one of the first, uh, we are planning uh, a continuing education event for providers. Uh, and if if it's if they if the CEUs would be accepted at the institute uh, international institutions, they would be welcome to participate. But we it is strictly about sickle cell trait, uh, mm -hmm. and they they have nice. access to five credits uh, for a very nice affordable price. And when I was speaking with a trait warrior about it, she said to me, "You know, I'm going to tell all of my doctors because this mm -hmm. is I want them to learn about me." Um, so. We, you know, we're going to continue. I'm, I'm just so excited. I, I use that word a lot, but Ferran, he knows. I mean, when, when I, I first stepped onto this platform, I thought it was just me. And he obviously thought it was just him. And we <laughs> found each other after a two or three year, um, you know, missing each other. Um, but the Aswan Foundation was started in 2007 and we started sickle cell trait focusing in 2012, mm -hmm. um, and we, I've been told by doctors, pediatricians, hematologists, oh, it's not sickle cell trait. Okay, so if it's not sickle cell trait, then what is it? And mm -hmm. I'm, on, and I'm on a track to find if it's not sickle trait, sickle cell trait, then what is it? Because the, the mm -hmm. answers are still needed. 
You know, people, you guys need these answers. You need to understand that, you know, you're parenting and, you know, bringing children into, into this world with, you know, uncertain. And of course, these answers are whatever the indicators are, you know, mm-hmm. if it's an ethnic, a skin color thing, meaning mm-hmm. that it's not taken as seriously because of the majority, the disparity majority, mm-hmm. whatever that is, we're here to tackle it all. Uh, mm-hmm. And our, our goal is 200 providers, but if we get 2000, we'll take it. And, and because it's virtual, it's a mm-hmm. virtual, uh, uh, our, our date is uh, April 22. And soon, once we have our graphic, we'll announce uh, a save the date and a link. But I encourage you to, especially those of you US-based, to encourage mm-hmm. your doctors, your providers, your nurses, your clinicians to get this uh, CEU, this continuing education. Uh, it's only five hours. And, and, mm-hmm. and I'm hearing i've been writing notes we could fill a few days now right now <laughs> yeah really yeah. Fill, uh, like a three four five day weekend yeah. uh, a conference of you know with all of these because your 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 voices your perspectives that my plan is to translate that into research that they will mm-hmm. pay attention to we get yes. the, we, this is called qualitative this is qualitative research getting mm-hmm. the voice of the people mm-hmm. yes so we're going to get these themes down and you know, put this in 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 a form that they can interpret it, that they are um, accustomed to listening to, and, and is mm-hmm. credible to them, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. nobody nobody's studying it in this way. Yeah, and I, mm-hmm. I wonder. I mentioned COVID before, but also the COVID vaccines. Like, mm-hmm. is that going to have a different effect if you're sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease? Yeah, and that and, and COVID in know. general is still not enough known. Just right. just in general. <laughs> Yeah. Let alone yeah, not the vaccine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Real quick about okay. that vaccine. I'm just saying. <laughs> I got shoes older than the yeah. vaccine. The way no, no, it so, so I don't so, see. Yeah. So my yeah. disclaimer: no medical <laughs> advice here. You know, I'm not a physician. Yeah, yeah. No, there's no medical advice. I'm just saying that was real quick. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm, but I'm, even I'm, even I'm if it, even if it works for the general population, though, there's still questions as to our abnormal hemoglobin right. Right? Mm-hmm. and how that's going to interact yeah i'm sure the they vaccine. haven't had samples you have you did jack did you have any um did um, you have any adverse re- reactions to it no more no more than i do with the flu vaccine i've mm-hmm. always said the flu vaccine gave me the flu no and they would yeah. always tell me oh, yeah, I, I, give you the flu. I would get sick as a dog when i took the flu vaccine mm-hmm. i used to re- use it for years till they came down it became mandatory for nurses to have mm-hmm. it so i had to finally start taking the flu vaccine and i would get sick and have to stay at home about two weeks yeah. after they gave it to me every mm-hmm. time so but i took the uh the covid vaccine which one just like the uh pfizer i think it's more effective <laughs> Uh, it did make my arm sore, just but so does the flu vaccine. Um, mm-hmm. It I had an upset stomach for about two weeks, just like I would with the flu vaccine. Um, mm-hmm. That was about it. Other than that, but yeah, I took mine because you know you're gonna need it to be able to travel, and I like to travel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I I I don't know. People look for um, natural ways, but Doctor Sabi. Um, oh, I, I follow Doctor Sabi till they Dr. kill the yeah. yeah, Doctor Sabi, oh. I, I have. <laughs> I have, um, I'm on his supplement. And, and mm-hmm. so what he discovered really was to how to clean the blood of mucus. Mm-hmm. And, and that is yeah. really, and, 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 he, and he also talks about how the lack of iron can cause so many other diseases. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you yeah. want, if you want herbal, you know, herbal stuff, there is, there's stuff out there, there is, yeah. you can take naturally. Um, unfortunately mm-hmm. he did pass away, um, but his family, um, they're still doing some work in that area. So yeah. I, I, I take a supplement and I'm doing that still before I get that vaccine, because I just want to make sure with my health, own health issues of yeah. low vitamin D and things like that. I'm like, nah, nah, I'm not, I'm not ready for that yet. So right. yeah. um, for well, the ladies, I, when I, I just had surgery for the ladies. I actually, I'll be 54 this year. Um, and I had surgery about a month and a half ago. Before my surgery, I took a prenatal vitamin for months because, mm-hmm. you know, everything is in a prenatal vitamin. And mm-hmm. it actually got my blood up to like a 10 
So, mm-hmm. her, so otherwise, when I would have showed up, they'd be like, oh, no, your blood's too low. We can't do the surgery. So I mm-hmm. just took a prenatal vitamin every day. So if y'all have problems, prenatal vitamins have everything in there that you need it. We ain't mm-hmm. pregnant, but hey, get all that stuff. And do and it, it worked for it me. It helps. And it helps. Moringa, Moringa is a, a big one as well. Yeah. It helps to cleanse the blood, oxygenates the blood as well. So, and it's it's got, I believe, 92 different nutrients in it as well. Um, I'm sorry, what, what was that called? Moringa, Moringa, Moringa Olifera. Mm-hmm. Why don't I have any paper? That's really good. Um, <laughs> the, the I, okay, Moringa, guys. as well as the sea uh, moss um, gel. Yes. Um, oh, yeah, the sea moss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I know we, about that sea moss. Yeah, I love speaking, it. Speaking, speaking of this question, uh, there's a question in the chat that's speaking to or asking about. I'm, I'm sorry, if I may. No, yeah, go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, uh, like Sean, I run marathons with sickle cell trait. Can anyone speak on suggestions for diet experiences that lessen sickle cell trait symptoms or foods that contribute to just feeling better? I answered number one, two, three through 10, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Yeah, uh, I, uh, there is a current professional oh, athlete with the uh, oh, New Orleans yeah. Saints yeah. by the yeah. name of uh, Ty Montgomery. He does have sickle cell trait, uh, <clears throat> and he, he speaks about learning how to eat and drink hydration when he was in college. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, had re- he had the advantage of really good trainers. And mm-hmm. um, so he eats hydration by consuming hydrating foods like mm-hmm. cucumber and melons and stuff. And yeah. then he is conscious about his need for rest. Uh, again, this goes back to the warm up and uh, recovery mm-hmm. and re- yeah. that re- rest is not, it's not negotiable <laughs> it's, right. and it really is not negotiable yeah. for any of yeah. us, but especially when there is this blood disorder that we don't know enough about that is in your body. Mm-hmm. Devard speaks very specifically about knowing your body and paying attention and- to what, yes, your levels are. He yeah. is retired, but he works yeah. out and, and still maintains his NFL fitness level Mm -hmm. uh, and then is an active father of three boys. Um, But he went into the gym one day and got on the treadmill and just wanted to go for it. And in going for it, dizzy, almost passed Mm -hmm. out, ended up Mm -hmm. vomiting, felt pain in his side. And he calls that an episode. And he's like, I can't do that. I I have to warm up. I have to make sure my hydration is fine. And Mm -hmm. I have to, he's also very much so into positivity therapy he speaks in the affirmative, he speaks positivity, you know, addressing that mental health part of it, mm-hmm. but he is very conscious about hydration. And it's something that is, I take it for granted. And I wrote Operation Hydration. Yeah. And, I take <laughs> and, and I think if you mention hydration right. as well a lot, what about um, sodium and other minerals that help you absorb the water? Mm-hmm. Because that, if you're drinking a lot of water, it can off balance your mm-hmm. ability to absorb and use the water, right? Right. Yeah, and I'm teetering into the medical advice, so I'm going to teeter back this way. Right, right. <laughs> definitely, it is a case by case. First of all, we're all different. Before mm-hmm. sickle cell, before sickle cell trait, we're all different. Mm-hmm. Then each sickle cell patient is like the snowflake. There's no uh, two snowflakes alike. So it is mm-hmm. case by case by case. So you are tasked with paying attention. You cannot do a better thing than to have a symptom journal. Mm-hmm. You know, you just can't. You, it, 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 is, it is like your Bible. You are taking this stuff down. You're doing, you can't do that enough. So mm-hmm. I, and, and I, like I said, I am a listener of the people. This is qualitative research is where I love to be. I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening for things. And I, I don't feel we've reached saturation yet. Saturation mm-hmm. where you're hearing the same thing over and over know. again. No, we, we've not reached saturation yet because the right person, the right people aren't hearing it. Um, when, we, when we have doctors overeducated about sickle cell trait, when we have sickle cell trait people that can go into a doctor's office in an ER, oh, and they know who you are, you're automatically triaged, you're automatically you know, dealt with, then maybe we're there. But mm-hmm. when sickle cell trait and sickle cell starts getting treated like cancer, maybe we've made some progress. Uh, so- I wanted- I want to drop some knowledge on the rhabdo. Um, oh again. yeah. No. So so the basics of rhabdo is once that muscle enzyme leaks into the bloodstream, it becomes mm-hmm. toxins. 
Mm -hmm. So it's it's leaking out myoglobin, which is muscle particles, but also the negative toxins in the muscles. So mm -hmm. the negative potassium is one of the major ones that if it enough of that leaks out into your bloodstream and it gets to the heart, it can trigger the heart in a negative function, which will mm -hmm. cause which causes the heart attack. And also when it reaches the kidneys, the kidneys can't filter all the toxins. So that's where renal failure happens. Mm -hmm. So people, like I said, without having sickle cell trait, you can experience rhabdo yes. just because of lack of dehydration or if you're on cholesterol medication. Mm -hmm. um, other, other red blood cell conditions also can trigger rhabdo as well. So mm -hmm. the, 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 the part about the sudden death with rhabdo is the negative toxins that leak into the bloodstream and they say it's the negative potassium, that if you already have heart issues, then can you imagine the arrhythmia that that that, that negative electrical charge can have on the heart? And so it gets mm -hmm. written down as heart attacks. And mm -hmm. when I when I was shared by my mental health provider, he wrote a call, he wrote a student handbook from high school to college, and he had two paragraphs or two pages of sickle cell trait exertion with athletes. And mm -hmm. no one had told me what that was until he says, what are you going to do when you retire? I'm like, mm -hmm. eh, maybe sell some hats and t-shirts. I have an idea for a sports brand. What's the count? Maybe I'll just do that. Um, and so he showed me that page in his book. Mm -hmm. And I read that. I'm crying. He's like, yeah, you could use your sports brand and become an advocate. I'm like, what's, what's an advocate? Oh, you mm -hmm. can actually share your story and educate people and sell your hats and t-shirts to pay for your travels. And I was like, what? But most of all, it was that he knew what rhabdo was and what the effects of it. And from that moment on, that was 2010, I've been at it because he showed it to me that mm -hmm. it gets overlooked, it gets misdiagnosed, and people have been dying for years. Yep. The military, the army is why they're doing the testing because they only look for anemia. They mm -hmm. block people who had sickle cell disease, you couldn't join. But they only look for your blood work with anemia issues. But now because it has happened for so much um, to, to military personnel and even in other branches as well, Navy. Um, so they, they, have, they finally had to take a look at it. They did do some studies mm -hmm. where they made everybody um, at certain temperatures drink water so it didn't single out trait carriers. It, mm -hmm. it did possibly reduce, but then if you have soldiers who are on their own exercising and traveling and doing all these things on their own and still not aware. It's not just, you know, when you're doing a physical fitness test. So mm -hmm. it is very, is very important. The rhabdo, especially when it's with the ECAS <clears throat> at that level of ex explosive, mm -hmm. the red blood cells explode. And so that is, wow. is one of the things that rhabdo is why rhabdo is so important and it's mm -hmm. really not addressed. So having that conversation added to the sickle cell trait or people have, again, you misdiagnose and you have sickle cell SC mm -hmm. in, in sickle cell SD, SC disease, the C trait crystallizes. So with people, people, person with sickle cell SC, the S mutates and the C trait crystallizes. So that's why they have different types of health issues. Um, and like I said, sickle cell and thalassemia, one mm -hmm. might not have enough red blood cells or too many red blood cells. So, if you don't know and you're not aware, it, it could be fatal. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what that's one of the risk factors that have been there in these documents, but nobody's really had those dialogues. So mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've, I've taken that on as, as the rest of my life as a conversation to make sure that if I could just bring that awareness, mm -hmm. you know, you right. can't tell people what to do. Nobody wants to be told what to do, yeah. but mm -hmm. if you can give them the information Knowledge. and the mm -hmm. knowledge and the willingness for them to look in their own life and be like, mm -hmm. hey, you know what? I do have something going on. Well, maybe I'm not saying that's what it is, but you could start there. And if mm -hmm. you at least start to there to rule that out, mm -hmm. then you may you may find something else. Like yeah. I have arthritis yeah. now, and I really didn't know that it was it could be from my rhabdo because yeah. of the muscle tissue breakdown. So I'm, my body is <laughs> inflamed because of my injuries, and that they're oh you have you have arthritis. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe there's something going on with my muscles, and that's causing right. the mucus to build up to get rid of the the, the muscle. And I'm you like, know, the wow. military, you get they hear the word arthritis, you get naproxen. Oh, they oh, do mm -hmm. things like yeah, that. It, 
<laughs> so so uh, so I've actually uh, actually approached um, the uh, arthritis foundation because they're doing studies on veterans because mm -hmm. a lot of us get out of the military with arthritis issues and yep. it's that skeletal muscular issues. So when I read that in the arthritis uh, report, I was like, that's me. <laughs> like right. I had a muscular issue. So I reached out to them. So I'm, I'm actually partnering with them now to do some arthritis conversations to get veterans to start speaking out because we're, we suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. You don't go to sick call, you know, you don't do yeah. none of that. So you just, that's, that's, that's so mentally through. ingrained from us from, yes. from mm -hmm. basic training, you yes. know, because yeah. you don't want to look like a malingerer. So even if it hurts, something mm -hmm. physically has to break yeah. Yeah. for you to be like, okay, yeah. Cause I mean, I used to Walk run all the time. Literally mm -hmm. what caused me to stop running my knee dislocated during a PT test. Wow. That's what made me, and I felt the pain and I was just good, whatever. Mm -hmm. No, I got to do this PT test. I want to get mm -hmm. this next promotion. I got it. And then my body told me to have several seats <laughs> and sit down somewhere. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. it really is. It's, it's even now, you know, I'm going through the, you know, I already have my rating, but I'm going through, I'm sure <laughs> all that. Yeah. And it's like, no, there's so much know. stuff we don't, we, yeah. we don't, we don't, we don't them. say. Mm -hmm. You got to tell them, you got to tell them, yeah. you got to tell them. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I, even today, I, I sold you, I sold you through my pain. So people don't, they don't know I'm hurting because no. I'm not going to show you, but yeah. the people who are close to me, like, man, you they need a cane. It. I'm like, I'm not walking with no cane. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not, oh. you will not catch me with a cane. Yeah. Now, and I, and I live in a six, seven pain and I only complain when it's like yep. nine or 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. But we're, it's that mental part that, that she was mentioning that we have to be able to peel that off because I'm sitting, that's why I looked at the Arthritis Foundation because I'm over here suffering in silence in my pain mm -hmm. and they, they you deem me with arthritis, I need to go look at research that. And that's when I mm -hmm. found all that information. So I'm going to find out because um, I, I have been suffering in silence for a long time and I'm, yeah. I, don't, I can't see what's going on inside of my body. So I think we have all have suffered in silence. I mean, Definitely. you go to, like I said, you go to the emergency room, they're not trying to help no. that chronic pain that you have every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this an everyday lifestyle. This yeah. is it's just normal. So you, it, we all just, that's all, the only thing we can do. Yeah. So I'm hoping this platform will find some type of a solution. I definitely believe it will. I think this is just the start, you know, for oh, more yes. people. We just need more voices. I think, like like Dr. Tamia said, you know, it's it's a qualitative research. So getting is um getting the voices, getting as many people to speak out and then being able to present, because my my hopes are to share this with my GP, to send on to everyone to forward on to their GPs and to be able to say, look. You guys fobbed me off all of last year. They ignored me. I had doctors literally get vexed with me on the phone because they weren't seeing me face to face. They didn't give me any pain relief after hospital this year, coming out of, well, being out of hospital mentally. Every day I'm finding it's such a struggle because it's like I'm still dealing with the trauma that you guys have caused from not listening. But then like um, Nikkei was saying about you know, the, the previous, the past history, the traumas, I've, I've lost children and some of the symptoms I've had during a crisis, I now look back and it's like, wow, that happened even then. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's just brought a whole nother level of, of trauma to, to the surface. It's like, wow. And then my face as well, my face is like experiencing all sorts of pain in my jaw I never knew that that was a thing until a few years I'd, I'd flown and um, I was talking to Agnes earlier um, a few weeks ago and we spoke about experiencing pain in the jaw and that was like whoa I've never heard of that in in the jaw but I experienced it twice on two occasions when I was flying and I love mm. traveling I never had that before until just then and then last year all these pains just came on and it was like this is weird this is new but I've, I've had it and is it related and then the most the more people were speaking out it was like whoa this is all in relation to my trait status and now I have something to pinpoint it to because everything else is fine um but like 
for wrong use of the secondary complications and, and illnesses that we can develop because we're not being heard, because we're not being listened to. That's the scary part because it's like the loss, the losses that we've already faced, that, you know, our health, careers, jobs, the, the times I've missed so much school, the times that people have actually said snide remarks and comments that are like really hurtful, the hurt that you can take on if you kind of, we are strong, we're strong. That's one hell of a thing I know because I think suffering in silence, like you said, all these Resilient. years, you know, we're, we're over 30, all of I, us. And I got one last one and, and this mm -hmm. is my most recent. So yeah. it's called the Eustacia tube. Mm -hmm. It runs from your ear to your oh. nose. Uh, yeah. So I've so, gone to the the ER a couple times because of that. I think. So go on. Sorry. Go on. So I I go to the VA and I'm tinnitus. like, no. So I this what happened. Tinnitus. So mm -hmm. I I was I, I I flew to Georgia to go visit my mom. On my mm -hmm. way to the airport, my ear clogged, and I'm like, oh shoot! Like I can't fly <laughs> like that. So I'm getting chewing gum. I get on the plane and I swear, I thought my head was gonna explode from the pain, right? So I get to, to Georgia, I, I take um, some medication and stuff, but mm -hmm. it doesn't unclog. Mm -hmm. So I fly back home and I put cotton and everything that I could to get back home at least, same mm -hmm. thing, piercing, piercing, piercing. I mm -hmm. go to the VA and they're like, okay, so they make you do all these tests before mm -hmm. they actually let you go see the specialist. So I did all their yeah. tests, balance mm -hmm. tests, all this stuff. And they finally, I finally get to the, to the specialist and he says, oh, well, there's the muscle in your eustachia tube has collapsed. Jeez, what's a eustachia tube? So that's why it's, you, you, your balance is off that's and your awesome. ear is clogged. It sounds like I'm muffled. And it has not wow. has not gone away, and there is no cure for it. He said that well, the military doesn't offer anything. They he said there is a, a clinical trial coming where they'll be mm -hmm. able to stick something in the in through there and then kind of open it back up. But I'm like peace. Wow. But yeah, so, Jones so now when I try to fly, I, 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 I put cotton, I put earplugs just so mm -hmm. I can make sure that it's already closed. Mm -hmm. because it's, it, it's painful to fly yeah, yeah. wow so, i ended up with that in too. jamaica i flew to jamaica and oh my god my ear hurts so bad i i went to the nurse and the little thing and she said well you can't go home oh no i'm going home yeah. <laughs> i'm flying back home it, it would not oh unclog I, I, could, I just I, kept I, I feeling can't. like i was talking in my own head and i'm like oh yeah. i can't do this it's awful yeah. yes so, yeah. i don't even want to fly i don't even want to fly because it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid of just that that piercing yeah, yeah. pain is mm -hmm. is, is yeah. horrible so. yeah so speaking of research you know there are clinical trials mm -hmm. and you know you do those at your discretion um but there are folk there's research that does do interviews and focus groups and i encourage you in the event that there is a sickle cell or sickle cell trait research that is doing research via focus groups and interviews, mm -hmm. um, jump in, yes. um, the, you know, tell your story uh, that, cause that's, that's really the only way. And I'm speaking as someone that's gonna be doing, that is doing this and as well as trying to encourage others to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to just remind Sean to, uh, not to single you out, but let's get to a nephrologist and, and mm -hmm. uh, figure out yeah. what's going on with that pain. Yeah. Um, uh, RMC can be diagnosed early. Mm -hmm. I know of a case where it was diagnosed in stage one and reversed. The tumor was removed and wow. uh, the child is, is living now, at, you know, I think 13 years old. She was, she was diagnosed as an 18 month old. So wow. um, it's not doomsday. And, you know, the advocacy would be, you know, the cost of annual ultrasounds for all trait warriors, um, something we're fighting for. You know, mm -hmm. we, we have to work with the American Medical Association to come up with a sickle cell trait death code so that the surveillance can be right. Because mm -hmm. if you're attributing a sickle cell trait death to a heat stroke or mm -hmm. something else, then we really don't have accurate numbers. And if yeah. we don't have accurate numbers, then we don't have accurate science. And that's the that's what the that's what's going to move our doctors. This is the system we have, 
and they look to that research journal. And if that research journal continues to say nothing to worry about, normal mm-hmm. life, you know, we're just kind of in a rut. We're running in that little wheel like the mm-hmm. gerbil. Um, mm-hmm. But we, we, we're going to have to be disruptive, not mm-hmm. disrespectful, not uncool, mm-hmm. but disruptive. Mm-hmm. Um, so make a, make a plan, make a commitment to participate in research. Mm-hmm. Um, tell, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to commit to letting you guys know about this CME so that if, if they can wow. and they are qualified, have mm-hmm. your providers participate because mm-hmm. this is about change making, you know, we, yeah. these conversations are good and therapeutic, by the way. Mm-hmm. So uh, that, that's the whole point of a, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Um, not focus group, support group. Mm-hmm. But we, we wanted to also put action there because, yeah. you know, you guys deserve this. Um, yeah. and, I, and so. I know that Dr. Mm-hmm. Maisha, who's on my, on my board and she's also creating her own organization. She, we were talking about RMC and what mm-hmm. happens is because the kidneys have those very, she says they're very small blood vessels. So what happens is when they get damaged, mm-hmm. that's where you may have those pains because the breakdown of all the muscles and all the toxins can cause that to scar. It's like scar tissue. So mm-hmm. once, it's, once they die mm-hmm. off, it starts to- be- But is that actually pain in the abdomen or it, like it around could, the kidneys area? Be, yeah, in the back? Be, okay. Exactly. I, I, don't, I don't experience that type of pain, but um, yeah. just mainly my legs and arms. Yeah. But, so but yes, RFC. as I said, they, I have had my kidney scanned and there were um, cysts that they say were benign, but that was mm-hmm. over five years ago. So I definitely yeah. need to have it checked again and make sure. Yeah, that, that, could be the scar, that could be the scar tissue from the breakdown of, your, mm-hmm. of those little small vessels that die, get, they die off and they mm-hmm. get clogged. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the RMC is becoming very, very important because. Yeah, there's a lady in the found. group who who's actually suffered a loss of her loved one. Um, so when she's ready, um, I've asked if she'd be willing to share her story because it's powerful. It's heartbreaking to read. Um, but um, yeah, I've, I'm just waiting for her time. Yeah. yeah. Guys, we have five minutes. Um, I have, it's I mean, I, I, yeah, I think this, we need another session. We need more sessions than just one. But I think this is just like, we've just opened so much and, and there's so much to be spoken about and to, to be discussed. There's so many different topics that um, affect, affect us all with regards to our trait status. And, oh, I, I just feel like, wow, this is just, I mean, I, I feel quite emotional. I'm, I'm, I've been struggling all, all morning. Um, till now to keep it together because I just feel like this is just it's doing something for me it's healing um, like Dr. Tamia said it's it's therapeutic to hear everyone's stories because for so long we've felt alone um, so let's just keep this keep our global voices united and, and just continue growing in number in strength because um, unity is power and I just think you know the more we the more we get together the more we share um, and, and take part in research. There were a few sickle cell studies that I tried to join, but a lot of them remain closed off. When you mentioned you, you just have, have the trait, um, right. they kind of don't wanna take you on if they're regarding sickle cell disease. Um, so it's just kind of just approaching people and saying, right, I'm, you know, I carry the trait. This is, you know, this is my story and saying, do you wanna hear it? Um, yep. And yeah. Um, Thank you, everyone, for for taking part in this. It's it's so important to to me, to all of us, to all of you. I truly am grateful from the bottom of my heart. And um, I I know Farron, you're you're tired. You must be exhausted now, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, hey, like I said, I, I, I accept I accepted this because I was born for this conversation. So I didn't yeah. care what time it was. I Thank said it, it was a perfect, it was perfect for my life to be able to share that, you know, coming out of my birthday. So yes. um, when you know you're born for a reason, and if we all Definitely. understand that, we're, if you believe that you're born for a purpose, mm-hmm. um, be the leader of your conversation. Don't worry yes. about followers, just be the Definitely. leader of your conversation. So that's what, that's what I get to do. Blessings. That's, that's powerful. Yeah. So um, on that note,
thank you guys so much and um i look forward to the next one i'll share this recording as soon as it becomes available um and yeah just i'm, I'm grateful to you guys it means dr austin means so much yes dr austin thank you for your time thank you for uh, <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. My partner is a very spiritual person mm -hmm. and she oh. heard Ferran when he said, when you're born with a purpose, she'd like you to repeat that because she's yes. about to blast that in her spirit. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, if you, believe, if you believe that we're all born for a purpose, mm -hmm. then we have a conversation that we need to serve to our community. That is, that is why we're born, to deliver Definitely. a message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she about to and break lead, out. You say, you said, and lead that conversation. And lead Don't that worry conversation. about the followers. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Lead, be the leader. Definitely. Leader she right that, she right <laughs> that. She right yeah. that. She yeah. right that. Yeah. Hey, and tell her. And tell her. 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 Look at Judges chapter four about okay, Deborah and Barak. Okay, we got the word up in here. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's and that's and that's my passage. That's my passage. Don't tell me a scripture. I'm gonna go right there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's it right there. Guys, yes. before it cuts off, I want to say thank you and bye. Um, and yeah, let's let our pain propel us into our purpose, and that's that's what we're here for. Exactly. You know? If 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 we had to go through this to reach others out there who need who need this support and who need this, you know, to know that they're not alone, well, it's worth it. Yep. It's worth it. Thank you. Nice to meet you, everyone. Nice, nice to meet you. Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you soon. Bye. See everyone soon. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. 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 Take a nap. Right. Me too. Bye. Bye. Bye.